This is the song we start with because it makes me feel good. The only way they're going to hear you, though, is if you pick up the microphone. <laughs> I'm not a pro It's like his yet, first. Man. I'm not a pro. It's, it's my his first year Freddie Prince Jr.'s first time in front of a microphone, everybody. That's right. You didn't know first, you had to pick it up. At work. First year rookie, but I'll still get rookie of the year. I'll, yeah. I'll still get there. I had a well, bad you're first game. A, 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 what's that called? A Louvre? A what? A lob. A what? You know that microphone they put on your... Oh, is that what they call them? It's not a Louvre. A Louvre seems French. It's just called a mic. <laughs> <laughs> I never met yeah. any French sound guys. You know, They're all from like Scarsdale. Oh, Pierre doesn't... He doesn't mic you up? I haven't up? met Pierre. <laughs> oh, Pierre's good. I like it. He yeah. goes up the front of your shirt with eye contact. I only know Mike and John. <laughs> no. That's it. Pierre will give you eye contact I don't want time. eye contact no, on my mic No, he tickles your session. belly button. I don't want belly button He goes one knuckle either. deep. Do you, no, <laughs> that's the worst costume wardrobe person ever. You don't want Pierre to go want, one knuckle deep? I want no knuckles deep. I want no depth. Can I tell you, not too long ago, I was doing a... This, they don't make music like this anymore. They try. It just doesn't work. No, they just don't. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, I had a, uh, I had a mic guy who always, when he put, you know, he was like, I'm going to run in my hand up the front of your shirt. Yeah. But he went palm forward. Palm, palm to skin. You know what I mean? Instead of, usually you palm get the back the of the skin. <laughs> he went palm forward and I was like, mm, and he always. Did you went, have a six pack then? Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Boom. But, but still. No, that's why. He liked the feel of a washboard from, like, me, from when he was a child doing laundry. On the, in, the, in Montana on the, on the lawn? Yeah. <laughs> but wouldn't you rather have him say, I, this is my theory on all that. Don't be sneaky. Because sneaky, I know, it's not that sneaky. <laughs> Just say, hey, I'm going to put my, this mic. Because they always look at you and they go, I'm going to put my hand up the front of your shirt. Yeah. But if you follow that with, and I'm going to turn my hand over so I can feel your abs... At least it would be less creepy to me. I'd be like, no, okay. No, you would give him an insta no. And that's why he can't be that direct. It has to be more passive and just, hey, is he going to say no? He's not going to say know? anything. Because when I was 12 years old, I did that to girls when I was trying to fill them up. Those girls? <laughs> it's just the 12 year old approach to, to they sound. Had six packs? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I dated Serena Williams. When I was in fifth grade, there was this girl, Stephanie, I forget. She was in fifth grade. And yeah. she was in sixth grade. Yeah. So I was dating an older woman. Nice. But so the big thing was, how am I going to let her talk her into letting me, it was going up the back of her shirt. Oh, you were Did going you, for the bra. Well, just the back of the shirt. Oh, like, you're just, just to you get want some, some flesh. skin. I you want some flesh. Right? Because in fifth, sixth grade, it was, it was not, well, back, I mean, I guess. I went for it. I'm not going to lie. You touch titties in sixth grade? <laughs> I went. I went for it, man. Uh, you, uh, you, I went back the shirt like a. I thought I was a I fucking was, man, bro. I was girl cra- in the first grade. I, I hope somehow someone knows Katie Cochran from Manzano Day School Katie in Cochran? Albuquerque, New Mexico. She has short hair way before short hair was cool. Uh-huh. Way before Charlie's Throne was doing it, and we were playing boys chase girls, and I caught her, and she Heisman the kiss. And I was, I like, was like, what? You first grade? Yeah, this yeah, is yeah. first grade. And she ran off again. I caught her again. She wouldn't kiss me. So I, I had these Sesame Street shoelaces. I took them out my shoes. I caught her again, and I tied her to the tree, <laughs> and I smooched her. I know this is against the law, <laughs> but it was, you know, 1980. Yeah, you know? I'm trying to think if, if you can prosecute. You better no, not you're be able to. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry, Katie. I should have said a different name. No, um, because so the, the bell rang. And I freaked out because I knew I was in trouble, so I just ran. I ran in the you classroom. You left her tied to the tree? Yeah, and the classroom was only like 20 yards from the tree. And so we had this teacher. Her name was Mrs. Syme. And uh, she goes, where's Katie? She was British. And uh, where's Katie? And you hear her screaming outside like, oh. help! <laughs> and my head is just on the desk in first grade, like five, six-year-old shame already. Oh, you she, knew shit was bad. Oh, she comes in with the shoelaces, and she just goes, who are these? And I literally was like, I look down and I'm just like, yeah. <laughs> Walk my eyes straight to the principal's yeah. office. Just knew I was done. So my mom was like, "What <laughs> on earth have you done?" Fred? She was. It was a private school where they paddled. Like they, they paddled. They wanted to. My mom didn't let them. Only she was allowed to smash on me. Wait and a boy, second. Did she ever? At the school you went to, you could paddle. Oh yeah, man. They cut holes in the board to cut down on the wind resistance. And it, so it whistled as it was coming towards your ass. <laughs> I don't know if it whistled, but it hurt. <laughs> did you get paddled? Yeah, I got paddled, but my mom had enough. Yeah. Okay, so what ages is this school? 
Um, this was a first through eighth grade. And you could paddle all the way through? He, up to eighth grade. And who yeah. did the paddling? Uh, his name was Mr. McEachran. He was the phys ed teacher. But once freshman Wait, the year, phys ed teacher got to do it? Yeah, Mr. McEachran. Yeah, but once those boys were big enough to fight back, they didn't allow paddling because Mr. McEachran was small and a freshman would have been like, yo, in, Yo, New Mexi- in New Mexico, we had like big Native American dudes that are yeah. like, dog, I drink on the weekends. Like, <laughs> they're not going to they're not going to have Mr. McEachern. <laughs> Wait a second. So I'm I, 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 I went to a public school. We did not have paddling. We, people got beat up in bathrooms. Oh, we got beat up plenty. But wait. So how did they decide a couple of questions? How do they decide how many paddles you get? OK. And like is was there like. Was there a certain rule like you didn't go, well, if you tie a girl up with shoelaces, let's check the chart. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> no. So. <laughs> oh, the chart. That's 74 paddles. <laughs> so two. And bare two, ass? Uh, no, you had your pants. Right. Uh, so Dick out or not? My dick remained in. Okay. <laughs> so two lunch. Det- you get a lunch detention. Right. For any trouble, regardless of what it was. Two lunch detentions equal to morning detention. Morning detention meant you came in before school and you did you ran laps, you did duck walks across the field, right. all kinds of bull crap. Three morning detentions and you got paddled. And Jeez. I never went to any of those fucking things. So I had a lot of paddles on the record, but yeah. I just wouldn't show. So when I finally transferred to public school, they weren't going to release my records until I took a whooping. And my mom literally was like, you hit my child. And I will shoot you. Now, mm. this is the 80s. Yeah. My mom's brother was a Vietnam vet. Yeah. He didn't go through customs on the way back from the war. <laughs> she had an armory. Okay. <laughs> she would have. They knew she would have. They handed my files over to La Cueva High School and life was good. Th- did you? <laughs> that is insane. I wonder if they still paddle there. You think they still I don't paddle? think so. It's got to be illegal. It's Now it's got to be. People freak out on that stuff. It's I mean, my mom used to make me pick my belt. She'd be like, well, pick your belt. And that meant your your ass was kicked. Which um, belt did you like to pick? Did you was a thinner one or thicker one? I mean, at a certain point, the walk is worse than the whooping. Yeah. <laughs> so small ones hurt more. Yeah. Uh, than than the wide ones, but it doesn't like. It's, no, it's all pretty no, terrible, isn't it? Yeah. A nine and a ten is still. Crappy. It's still a. It's still an yeah. ass whooping. Yeah. <laughs> Wait. Okay. Do you? All right. Because I did not get belt. But I'm not opposed to people spanking their kids. Yeah. Okay. Um, did you did that? Like, how does that translate to you parenting now? Just out of curiosity. I have never. I know you don't take the belt. I've never. Would never. Like, I'm all about trying to talk and yeah. not lose my pay. Look, I before. Is that because of your experience? No. It's a level. It's just a level of patience. My mom didn't have a husband. Like, yes. He killed himself. It, she was a wreck after that. And oh yeah, she had to raise a son that looked a lot like him and had the same name. So her patience was like at a two. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it yeah, was yeah. like, here's a, a punch for what you're about to do today <laughs> that I'm sure I'll get a phone call about at noon. So that was more what she had to do. Like, were I've you had, an unruly kid? Um, prepubescence. Yeah. Cause I, every kid had a pops, but me and kids started asking me questions about my dad and I didn't know, for those who didn't know, like my pops was Freddie Prinz. He was a comedian in the 70s and he shot himself in the head um, on January 28th, which was my mom's freaking birthday. I did and, not uh, know that. Yeah. And, and he, he passed on. So he had the number one show in America in the 70s. Mm-hmm. It was called Chico and the Man. And so all these kids that I went to school with, their parents were mad wired into his life and death. Yeah. And so kids were asking me a lot of questions that my mom didn't know how to prepare me for. Um, I was getting in a lot of fights. I was getting in a lot of trouble and she just didn't, she didn't know how to do anything other than like, damn it, stop. Yeah. And then yeah, yeah. that would wake me up a little. And when I got older and those didn't work, um, she would kick me in the balls one time. Um, did that work? I tried to no sell it, but to no you avail. Know, you can't no sell that. <laughs> I tried to be like Andre the Giant yeah. in those old Japan matches yeah. where he just let it, he'd be like, "No, bro, I'm way bigger. F you." But instead, it was like, what "No, a great mom." Reference, Ooh, dude. What dead. a great fucking. I used reference. to work for Vince McMahon, bro. I know wrestling better than so anyone you, you'll ever you meet. You stood there for a second, and you're like, "I'm gonna be able to ride this out." It and was, then about three seconds in, you're like, "No, I'm not." I'm it was not like riding. you ever watch hockey and you see the guy get checked and he bounces off the wall and he has like. Yeah. Two good strides, and yeah. then it's like, 
There we go. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. And it's done. That's what happened. That's what yeah. happened. That always is like, I always, when you see video, I'm like, how did that dude walk out of that car crash? And he walks, he takes four steps, and he's like, I'm he's alive? Like, I didn't. I'm going to fall down now. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. There was an old fight between Zab Judah and Kostya Zoo, and they were both really popular boxers at the time. And Zab Judah gets beat in this fight. He takes this hook. And he, his knee touches the canvas, and he jumps up as quick as he can to show the ref that he's okay. And he's staggering all over, and the ref's trying to call the fight, and he goes, I'm okay. And he throws this huge left hook and just knocks himself out and I falls know, on the ground. Talking about, yeah. yeah, and yeah. it's like, those are the moments. And the ball shot was that. It was the, no, no, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you know <Dunzos>. what? <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and tip my hat to you on this one. You got me on this one. You yeah. got me. So after that, she, she shipped me out west, and I got to meet my, my uncle Ron de Blasio, who just had his uh, 84th birthday. He was my dad's manager. Uh, he was Richard Pryor's manager. He was Prince's manager. And he was just this epic well of knowledge. And yeah. He was the first guy to really break down, not how my dad died, but I almost cursed. But why, You can curse on here. But fucking why? Um, Did that help you? Yeah. Um, he walked me in front of Marilyn Monroe's house and told me the story about Marilyn Monroe and, and like the tragedy of it. He lived like two houses away from her cause he was rich as hell. Yeah. And, uh, so he's telling me the story and then he connects Marilyn Monroe to my father by talking about, you know, stars that shine too bright. Yeah. And they went and he knew that I liked space and I used to build rockets and stuff like that. And he you goes, did? Yeah. I was really into science and dungeons and dragons and martial oh, I did arts. Some like, D &D that was my too. whole, that was my yeah. whole life when I was a kid. And he, exp he compared my father and Marilyn to a supernova when a star goes supernova and, uh, and it explodes. And I remember like, how old were you? I was uh, 12. I was 12 years old. No, 11 years old. I was getting ready to go into sixth grade. And uh, it was that summer vacation. And I remember everything kind of clicking. And then he just legit took me to the improv. I was 11, 12 at midnight and getting to see like Bobby Slayton tell me stories about my dad. Pitbull like, of comedy. And be like, oh, you fucking dad, man. This son of a bitch. You'd always take too long and I'd never get on stage. <laughs> but I loved that. Yeah. And Charles Fleischer, who was the voice of Roger friggin' Rabbit, opened for my father on his first comedy album. And, and I'm meeting the voice of Roger Rabbit. I'm 11, okay? Yeah. It's a big deal. The Roger Rabbit is a huge, huge deal. And he hates the rabbit. And he did it for me. And he tells me this story. He says... Uh, he goes, uh, you know, I opened for your father, Mr. Chow's, in, in Chicago in 19... That sounds like Peter Falk, but they kind of sound the same. It's pretty close. Um, By the way, nobody listening knows either voice. So you okay, can do perfect. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so he's Chinese. <laughs> yeah. um, oh, Mr. Wong. Chow's a <laughs> And he says, <laughs> your dad walks into the dressing room. Remember, I'm 11. And uh, he comes in and he says, hey, uh, Charlie, you think you have a bigger dick than me? I'm 11. <laughs> and he goes, he goes, I look at him and I go, yeah, probably. And he goes, well, let me see it. And he says, well, I'm not gay. And so I, I pulled it out, and he looks at it, and he goes, nope, mine's bigger. And he walked out of the fucking room. <laughs> I'm 11 years old, and this guy just made my father the coolest dude. Yeah. And every story that I heard about my dad up until that point was, oh, my God, I loved your dad so much. He was magic. Right. And that don't mean shit to me. Like, I, have, I had no memories of my father. I, the only memories I can get are if you met him, and I can steal one from you. So it fills and in the so, blanks a little for you. Yeah, so that takes your father away from superhero status and just makes him this three-dimensional character instead yeah. of a comic book character, which is what he was to me for so many years. Um, is that when you moved out here when you were uh, when you were 11? Hold on. Yeah. Listen, I, I'm going to do something incredibly unprofessional. What? I had started with no mic. Yes, but my, everybody listening knows my son, Jacob. He needs... He, okay. I need to call. Okay, we're going to put him on speaker. Does he want the Roger Rabbit voice? He's at the dentist right now. <laughs> hey, Dad. Hi, buddy. You're on speaker, and we're doing the podcast, and Freddie's here, too, so go ahead. What's oh, well, it, it, it's, kind of, it's kind of concerning, like, the health insurance card for the dentist. I can just do it when we get back so you guys don't have to interrupt the podcast. Well, where, what, is it something that you're, you're still going to be able to go to the dentist? Go okay. for the laughing gas. Sounds good. Yeah, make sure you get laughing gas. That's important. Laughing it's fun. Okay, I'll make sure. All right, buddy. Love you. Uber home. Bye. Oh, I saw my future. That's my buddy. <laughs> um, what, when did you move out here? How old were you? Um, I was back and forth from age 11 to 18, and then in 1994, I moved out here full time. And did you... Okay. Because right now, 
you you don't act as much as you used to, and that's no, a I'm, conscious. Yeah, effort. I'm. You're done. done. Yeah. Did you start acting because you thought that's what you were supposed to do? It was exactly what I was told to do. <laughs> yeah. So when I was six, when I was sixteen, my grandfather, God rest his soul, um, was a little bit racist. <laughs> my, by a, the way, listen, mine too. My grandparents, you know, one of my brothers only ever dated black girls. <laughs> and, okay, and so <clears throat> my grandmother at one point referred to her in Boston. Uh, she was lived in uh, Florida at the time. Okay, but she was referred to her, uh, referred to a black person as colored. Yes, and I was like, Nana, that's not okay. And in her mind, that was the nice thing. That to was call. the nice thing yeah. to say to not be racist. Yeah. Yeah. She would even say, I didn't say, and then she said the n word. I'm like, yeah, the, neither one of those. Just <laughs> You're so like, you know. yeah, how about never <laughs> say that? <laughs> how about neither one of those are good? But in their brain, yeah. Right? Isn't that different generation, man? They were all a little bit racist. Even all when of them. they didn't think they were being a little bit racist, yeah. they were being a lot fucking racist. A lot effing racist. Right. Yeah. You can swear. I this, keep forgetting. I'm yeah. sorry. I, I'm a rookie star. I told you. We're halfway through the first game. <laughs> um, I'll have a good at bat, man. It's yeah, coming. Yeah. It's coming. So you got into it because you feel like that is what you were. Yeah. What, my grandfather, when I was 16 years old, got cancer and, uh, and couldn't Dude, fight it for very long. How do you deal with so much loss? before the age of fucking 18 i didn't until i was like 30 <laughs> it really like like it it drove every choice i made like i when you're a junior it's hard enough okay because yeah. you're basically a statue built to honor that which walked before you um i had never thought of that before it's weird man it's every junior i talked to was like dude oh my god and i'm like yeah right <laughs> yeah. um but uh you know my grandfather he he was croaking and he was on hospice care and my my grandmother said uh you know papa wants to go and speak with you and i i, I went in his room and he would call me federi which is a federico federi italian for freddy right and he says uh in italian he says federi did you did you clean your room today and i said uh see si, papa see si. and he says in english he says i'm so proud of you and I'm 15, 16. Yeah. I don't know what that means. I'm like, I clean my fucking room. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I do that a lot, by yeah, the way. Yeah, I'm a pretty good kid. <laughs> yeah. Like, what the fuck? I play Nintendo games. Yeah, it's yeah. easy to clean up. It's easy. And uh, in the same breath, he takes my hand, and he's strong as hell. Like, I never beat him in arm wrestling ever, and I tried from, like, age like That old man strength is, 15. is bizarre. It was ridiculous. And he holds my hand, and he goes, you know, your now I have to cuss. He goes, you know, your father really fucked things up, and it's up to you to fix it. And an hour later, he was dead. For real. Yo, <laughs> that is not like, Yeah, but how do I fix it? <laughs> <laughs> For real. That's like him saying, the secret to life. <laughs> <laughs> For real, man. So it was, when I first moved out here. What a mind fuck that Fear is. is a big motivator and, and fear of, of failing what he needed and fear of letting my, my mother down who was against me coming out. Well, how did you interpret that your grandfather thought you needed to fix it by, by, by taking his legacy to a different level? By erasing... When you heard his name, the first thing you heard was suicide right. and drugs and he had all these like amazing, they're horrible, but in hindsight, amazing, awesome affairs with like Pam Greer and Raquel yeah. Welsh and Rachel Ward. Legendary. And Joanna Kearns from Growing yeah. Pains when she was a smoking hot dancer off Broadway. Yeah. Uh, oh, let me tell you this story. Okay. I, I did. A, I always know when an, one of these old school actresses fucked my father <laughs> because, and there have been a lot of them. All right. I'm only saying the names of the women who have spoken about okay, it. Okay. Okay. Um, cause they all say hi to me different when they meet me. When, when I just meet some old school actor, I met like time daily and she goes, Oh, hi, it's so nice to meet you. And she has yeah. like rose petaled lenses on literally and speaks that way as well. And then you meet like Pam Greer and she's like, Oh, oh hi, nice mm -hmm. to meet you. And yeah. I'm like, Oh, you guys fucked. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> and she wrote about it in her book. So I'm doing a pilot. <laughs> the, the guy that married my wife and I, um, because her mom wanted it. Jewish and my mom wanted a Catholic, so we had our friend. We did the same thing. We had our friend who got ordained online. He was just a gay choreographer, be our priest to kind of f you both of them. We did the, we did the same. <laughs> you got thing. to. We're modern people. You we know, we got to make thing. sure it's about us yeah. and not something else. Um, so he directed this pilot, and Joanna Kearns was in it. And I go into the trailer, and it's just her. And as soon as I see her, if if you had a video cast, I would do the face facial expression that she did. But it literally was like. And her eyes got really big. And so before she spoke, I was like, 
they fucked. <laughs> and so I sit down and she said, hi, I'm Joanna. I go, hi, Joanna. I'm Freddie Prince Jr. Nice to meet you. And she goes, uh, you know, I met your father. And I'm like, yeah. yeah I'm yeah, assuming. I bet you did. Yeah. And she tells me this story and I'll, I'll, I'll share it with you. So my old man was on a date with her and Pam Greer at the same time. And they were at a restaurant in, in he asked Hollywood. Yeah, they both out on it. Yeah, and they both said, yeah. He was a pimp, man. He was like six, two and a half. Had the, the Magnum uh, P.I. mustache. That mustache, by the way, <laughs> was very real. And his hair was The fantastic. hair was on point, dude. Yeah. The hair on was point, on point. Yeah. And men would wear platforms so they could be as tall as him, yeah. like Tony Orlando, you tiny fool. <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> he was doing comedy at my dad's funeral, so I can crack jokes on him. Was he? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So my dad's on this date, and, the, and Richard Pryor calls the restaurant. And says, uh, hey, I'm having a party. Freddie, why don't you come over and bring the girls with you? You're not bad with voices, and, buddy. <laughs> I just want you to know. You're not, I, I do it's a, a uh, skill. I do a Star Wars cartoon, and I work with like all these like voice legends. Yeah. And I just ask him to do, like, I met the guy who does Winnie the Pooh. His name's Jim Cummings. And I'm like, hey, man, can you do this Snoop Dogg rap for me in Winnie the Pooh? And he'll do it. Now, I can't do Winnie the Pooh, but when you hang around these guys, you can do bad versions of yeah. all the impressions yeah. they do. So all mine are just crappy versions. So Richard calls the restaurant. You come on over. And my dad brings both the ladies over. Only Richard wasn't having a party. He got a hold of one of my dad's old Playboy radio recordings. And c comedians used to go on there in the 70s and do like an hour just like on a mic on, for the radio show. Right. And my dad didn't like the set that he did. It was something that he, it was only like 15, 20 minutes. And he just didn't like the jokes. And Richard got it. And when they came in, there's nobody there. There's no party. It's just Richard with the tape. And he's playing it because he was in love with Pam Greer. And uh, he's like, look, you ain't funny, motherfucker, talking all this shit. And my dad's like, yo, man, you better give me that tape. And, uh, and she's telling me this story. And I'm sitting back. And at a certain point, I'm, I'm realizing this is the best story that anyone has ever told me about my father. And yeah. I've heard a bunch. Um, and so he's still talking trash. My dad's, you better give me that tape. Or he goes, I ain't giving you shit, motherfucker. He's way bigger than Richard Pryor. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And my dad used to spar with Muhammad Ali. And so, is that true? Yeah, we have a towel with Ali's blood on it. I'll tell you that story if you want. Yeah. So my dad jumps over the table, and Joanna Kearns is telling me this, punches Richard, yeah. grabs a tape, takes Pam, leaves her, and splits. <laughs> and As a consolation prize? <laughs> no, he just knew it would make Richard angrier <laughs> if he took Pam. <laughs> So I, told, I asked her, I said, well, what did you do? She said, I got him a towel, and he called me a cab, and then cussed me out for no reason, and I left. <laughs> <laughs> and I was sitting there that going like, what amazing. the fuck? That's, yeah. And do these stories, <laughs> they help you? Even at this mm. point, do they help you now? I love, I love it. I met, like, when I worked for Vince McMahon at WWE, um, we did, uh, I, me and this other guy pitched an old school night where they'd wear the old powder blue tuxedos. Good stuff. We got Jesse the Body and Vince to even commentate a match. And like we did all the, and we brought old school wrestlers back like Sergeant Slaughter and this one dude. Where's Ivan Putski? <laughs> we didn't bring Ivan. Putzky. I want to know where Ivan Putski is. He's got to be 87 years old. I don't right know, now. but I don't want him to work and get hurt. <laughs> we, had, uh, we had this wrestler named Alberto Del Rio, whose father uh, and uncle were both famous luchadors. And the WWE had one, and his name was Chavo Classic. And we had Chavo like, drive him out in this fresh ass lowrider. And backstage, I'm telling Chavo how the segment's going to go. And, and he goes, Hey, man, I met your father one time. And I'm like, Oh, where? I go, Yeah, tell me. He goes, Do you mind if I tell you the story? He goes, There's kind of drugs involved. I go, No, man. It's okay. I, yeah. I understand. It was the seventies. He goes, yeah, it was. He goes, man. He goes, I was working a match in Chicago. He goes, I was with you, Frank Sinatra, and the Italian mob, and I never got that high of cocaine in my <laughs> life. And I literally was sitting there like, and Vince is to my left, waiting for me to like pitch this guy a segment. And Vince just looks at me and goes, Jesus Christ, Freddie. <laughs> Walks away. I'm like, oh my god, dude. That blew me up in front of my boss. Thanks, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> like, that is amazing, though. To continuously, even at your age, yeah, still get to learn to more. To get to more. learn more. The and good, more. the bad, the funny. The uh, you know, but I you don't want judge. All that. So yeah, you, you want, want a you want a three dimensional you? picture. Yeah. Tell me about the Ali story. Okay, so my dad to date is the youngest person ever to host the Tonight Show. Uh, he did. Uh, the, the comedy bit on Johnny Carson and Johnny brought him over to the couch and two weeks later asked him to host the fucking show for him when he was with one of his ladies. Yeah. And uh, my dad's guests were George Foreman, um, Paul Williams. Um, Paul Williams. Who's my uncle Paul still to this day. I, I, he was the one who picked me up from the airport in his black Ferrari Testarossa the first time I ever came to California. I still 
now this has been a couple years the last time i saw him but i remember seeing not maybe five six years ago in yeah. studio city thinking to myself that's fucking paul he's Williams. still such a boss dude. yeah he's dude. so freaking cool same man. hair still right same hair can still, Is he still wearing sing, the same glasses same glasses oh. still was the voice of the penguin in the awesome 90s yeah, batman yeah, yeah, animated yeah, 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 series yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> the man yeah so he has these guests on and by the way can i just make a side note 70s Hollywood is... We need time machines, Josh. That is the time to be here. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And you know what else I like? I like... I like who the 70s stars were. Yeah, man. And the things they had to say. I just... They were so much... People were pushing social agendas in such an organic, cool, funny fucking way. And you were allowed to speak? Yeah. Well, there was no instant audience feedback of, hey, that offended me. Me too, me too, me too, me too. You know, it was just like, I don't care if you're offended. Fuck you. You have no voice. And that's kind of what Hollywood was back then. We're like, we are the voice of the voiceless. you know what else they were? And I do miss this. And it's one of the reasons I'm glad Jack Nicholson hasn't done 97 appearances on The Tonight Show. He's a fucking movie star. Yeah. Yeah. I like the separation. He stayed magic. You know what? He stayed and, and magic. Say what you yeah. want about Leo. I like that he doesn't do a fucking I, million. Do I people love not him. dig Leonardo DiCaprio? They think he's aloof. He's a movie star. He killed a fucking bear. Dude. Are you shitting me? Come on. I love Leonardo DiCaprio. The only movie I didn't like was the, not the island. What was that survival Oh, I know one the one you're talking about. Kind of Lord of the Rings. It was, I think it was called The Island. The Island. Whatever. But every other movie he's done, I've been like, yo, he Fuck. kicked some ass in that Dude, movie. I, I think he is like a They just badass. don't like him because he's good looking, man. And you know what else they don't like him? They don't like him because <laughs> he's, he's, he's skinny fat and he can fuck whoever and he wants. And he got Giselle Bunchen and didn't even have to marry yeah, her. Like, you know what I mean? Like Tom Brady had to put a ring on it. Leo's like, nah. And most guys need to die. I don't die. play quarterback, yeah, bro. No, but guess what? I'm Leonardo DiCaprio. Yeah, deal with it. Most guys got to diet and do sit-ups to get women. He nah. looks like he rolls out of bed. Like a pro poker player. Yeah, full beard. <laughs> For with real. a big, you could go three knuckles oh, deep. Oh, I knew you were going to do it. As soon as we talked about it, I knew it. But, and he doesn't care. No. But that's the same thing. It's the same thing with my theory on Johnny Depp and Brad Pitt. When you're that good looking, they're like, let's see how ugly I can get and still fuck whoever I want. I so hope that's how it works. They're just like, I'm going to ugly it up and I'm still going to just fuck whoever I want. How about that? Um, I had such a complex from being a dork as a kid. I didn't try to ugly it up too much, although my choices to look cool were somewhat questionable. I feel the same way. Like I'm not confident enough to... The, like The 90s hair was just a whole decade. Did you mullet no but i had like the side spike in the 80s you did yeah and then i had like the wax sideburn spiky thing in the 90s that i went sucked. mullet i went that's full worse <laughs> yeah I, went, I did purple tips and like different colors that sucks i did um it's cool now down to the middle of my back dude you went like bon jovi jersey status <laughs> big time with my fucking overall only one girls with big time bangs yeah, had a thing dude. for you though fucking, I, I mean, overall with only one strap no shirt no, you underneath did yeah. not. you are no you're Fuck a comedian yeah, and nope. that's a great joke no i did I went are you shitting overall me overall one strap Fuck yeah. Okay, so my bad choice, that's your bad choice, although it's awesome. My bad awesome choice was the Z Cavaricis where you would taper oh, yeah. and roll it up. And on the inside of the pants was like a cool yellow Pattern? zebra design. Yeah. That was my horrible yeah. awesome choice. What kind of shoes were you rocking? Uh, you Br- I had British out. Knights and I had Converse. You Those BKs? Are, it was New Mexico. You had to look hard or you get the shit kicked out of you quick, man. Really? Dude, I was part Puerto Rican, so it was like I wasn't Mexican enough for the Mexican dudes. Oh, and the right. white guys were like, what's up, Beaner? And so you would fight, but it was just me and black dudes getting each other's <laughs> back. That was it, man. Did you fight a lot growing up? <laughs> yeah, but my godfather's Bob Wall, man. So it was like, oh, that was the Ali story. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so my godfather's a dude who literally trained Bruce Lee when Bruce came to America and Bruce trained him as well. But what kind of martial art would you say Bruce Lee did? He would call it Western boxing. It's technically defined as Jeet Kune Do, which is like a modified version of Kung Fu, which, which is why he called it Western boxing, which is basically like strike the closest part of your opponent with the closest part of you. So is there anything now that he's close to that? Like any, uh, I mean, I think he brought a lot of Western boxing into Kung Fu. He established a jab that before a Western, just a jab where right. you shuffle the feet forward and jab. And that wasn't something Kung Fu it taught wasn't? a lot. No, Kung Fu was a more squared stance. Yeah. And he took a more, 
I don't want to like make Chinese people mad, but he took a more Japanese karate stance right. as opposed to being squared up. So he turned his body. Which seems to be smarter for fighting. Yeah, you're a smaller target, right? Yeah. Like that's why Floyd Mayweather never gets hit. He turns sideways. There's less of him to hit. I've always um, and said, that's what by Bruce way, tried to do. I've always said like I know people get on Floyd Mayweather, but if I was a boxer, I would try not to get hit too. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, my, <laughs> my issues with Floyd are more stop hitting chicks, start hitting women, yeah. stop being an asshole, and knock out guys, yeah. not women. But like, as far once as you do that, in we're the cool. ring, yeah, don't get hit. Don't get hit. I'd like to see you try to hit him too yeah. more. Yeah, but his hands have been shattered for years. He, Is that true? Oh, he had to get those lidocaine injections. He had broken his hands. His hands have been shattered for years. Yeah. So he's beating people on picking his spots yeah. which he can masterfully well i don't know if he can do it anymore let's see if he comes out of retirement i don't I, I think the only way he comes out is if he comes out he fights somebody his age he's almost my age and i believe me i'm my brain sees a lot of stuff that these young guys i'll buy yeah. box with wayne mccullough um he's a three-time world champion boxer I, I train with tony ferguson he's a ufc fighter on an eight fight win streak and I'll see things that my brain's like, there it is. Move to the left. <laughs> Go for the liver. And my legs are like, man, fuck you. <laughs> fuck you, brain. <laughs> like, like, we went hiking this morning, bro. Are you crazy? And I just get smashed off. I got up at 8 to make breakfast for the kids. <laughs> Telling you, dude. I'm not stepping to my left, motherfucker. Watched 14 consecutive episodes of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Oh. I love Seth Green, but I'm done. Did like, you, I'm how many times have you out. seen Frozen? A lot. A lot. I can do the movies... The Disney movies a little bit more because I was raised on like the Jungle Book and shit like that. And I can always say, okay, we watched Frozen, but now we got to watch an old school one. And do you do that? Yeah. Like we, watch, we read the Harry Potter books before she gets to watch the movies. So it's always like one for one. She has to have balance. You know what my balance with my, with my kids has always been? Mine is more with toys. Every, toys, to yeah. every toy that you get, one leaves your room. You, like get a, you get a new toy, we're donating one. I like that a lot. So when yeah. holidays come, you want to grip a shit? Prepare to get rid of a group That's of good. Shit. We do like a once a year it. thing yeah. where it's like, hey, find all the stuff you don't play with anymore. Let's put it in a bag and then we'll donate. Yeah. That's what we do. Uh, yeah, for me, it's like important for them to see. I, it's not just you're not masturbates from the toy yeah. with like <laughs> toy dogs that actually piss on your friends. Yeah. yeah. And you also like, it's important, like when, especially because Jakey, Jacob got, uh, my two oldest kids saw. My ex getting her stomach pumped. They saw a bunch of shit. And so they and they lived in some we lived in some pretty, I don't know, we, one bedroom, three kids, a thousand dollars a month. I don't know if that's considered poverty, but it's not great. It's not fun. It's not. And especially here in Hollywood. Yeah, I could probably do that some places around the country and be like, oh, you're OK. But in Hollywood. Yeah. In Montana, you can pull that off. Probably so. Yeah. Probably so. Can't so, really <laughs> pursue your career in Montana. <laughs> <laughs> no. Comedy clubs aren't okay, that know, big there. I did a show, a one nighter in Montana once. In Helena? I think it was it's Bozeman. the only city I know. I think so. it was Bozeman. It was a one nighter. <laughs> And I, I forget. It's either Bozeman or Billings or Butte. It's one of the Bs. You know every city in Montana. I was just joking. I threw you, a random <laughs> state out. What the fuck? When you do a shit ton of one nighters, is is you're when you're fucking cutting your teeth. You real. <laughs> but one of the B cities, there was a lot of. Uh, we don't say midges anymore, right? What do we say? Little, little people. people. Yeah. There were a lot. There was a lot of little people in that community, and so they were. There was like a whole table of them up front, and it's not a big deal, but it's probably a heads up for a comedian though. It's a heads up. <laughs> That's it's a heads like up. You should be given. a holy grail. You're yeah. like, and you sat yeah. up front. It, it's, like, it's just like you know. My wife once she was like, "Hey, someone's coming over to fix the computer," and I go, "Okay." And someone. She didn't. I opened the door and it was a little person. Yeah. Now look. If it catches you off guard, yeah, you're gonna make a weird face. Yes. So I told her. I said I made a weird face, and she goes, "Why?" I go, "Why don't you fucking tell me?" <laughs> Just give me a heads up. And she goes, I didn't want to seem prejudiced. I'm going to go, that's not prejudiced. That's just saying, hey, he's coming over. You're like, I'm the one that's yeah, prejudiced. Yeah. <laughs> Help me out. Yeah. Yo, I, my, I hate, I shouldn't admit to this, but you did. I had the exact same thing. We were, <laughs> we were walking in New York through Madison Square Park by the Shake Shack there. Yeah. And uh, to get a burger. And I turned and there was a little person like right up on me. And it kind of caught me off guard. And they have that short little like two foot fence. And I kind of did a hope. Yeah. And hopped over it. You hopped over it. And Sarah goes, Sarah goes, what the, what the hell was that, Freddie? Because the guy was kind of like hot. And yeah. I get it. Like, yeah. And instead of like owning up to it and being like, yeah, I was messed up. I go, well, he snuck up on me, Sarah. It freaked me out. Because I didn't want to like admit like, yo, I need to grow as a person. But yes, I've grown since well, when then. When you say grow as a person, is that a dig? Stop, at the come on. Don't that throw that I can't believe you said that right now. I wish you'd talk about knuckles and belly buttons right now. Tell me the Muhammad Ali story. <laughs> okay. By the way, I have a. 
terrible habit of jumping off of topics. I don't care. Don't okay. care. I do too. All right, yeah. Um, I have kids, so <laughs> we're good, man. Yeah, yeah, they yeah, do yeah, the yeah. same thing. I'm like, what? 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 <laughs> um, so <laughs> my dad did this incredible impression of Ali beating George in Zaire on the Tonight Show when he hosted it, and George did the bit with him. And my dad had this amazing Ali impression, and he could even like you know pretend to move yeah. like him. And George let him knock him out, right? And then sign the gloves. Is that on YouTube? Because I'm, I'm sure it is. I'm if not, we can that. find it yeah. through NBC. Um, and he signed the gloves to Freddie, best pal and champ, George Foreman. And I had the, still have those. And as a kid, I say sign them to me because kids didn't know about right. my dad. Um, so anyway, um, they did this, and Ali really liked my dad's impression, and they became friends. And my dad used to go to his house a lot and they would spar and Ali would whip his ass. And like, he's pulling his punches, but when Ali's pulling his punches, it's still way sicker than you. Yeah. And my dad would go home with black eyes and bloody noses and he got sick of getting the shit kicked out of him. And he heard that Steve, Mc, guys like Steve McQueen and James Garner, all these LA tough guys were training with this dude named Bob Wall. And so he started training with Bob and my godfather taught him the the Tommy Hearns check hook, which is a pivot off your front foot and you move away and you hit them yeah. with your front hand in a hook, which is more like a winging motion if you're not into boxing. By the way, what a punch Tommy Hearns. It's that, like the that like dude Floyd, has, that's the only knockout Floyd gets is yeah. the check hook these days. But Tommy Hearns, I f like for a dude that skinny to have that power. Bro, him and like Alexis Arguello, oh. who's more obscure, those two guys had torque. <laughs> that, that is what it is, right? You know what I'm saying? Is like, that is, there's what, leverage, and then there's leverage. <laughs> <laughs> that dude has Those a in his glove. Can hit. Yeah, and by yeah. the it's like a whip. So by the time that fist gets there, it's just ba boom. <laughs> <laughs> and you're done. I love the slow mo when you see someone's entire. Oh. When the skin on their face gets displaced to the dude, other half of their face. I'll text you some photos I have. Some original prints of Madison Square Garden fights of like Sugar Ray Robinson smashing Kid Gallivan's face and his. It's just all mush and looks CGI and it's black and white. I'll, I'll, I'll text fought, it to you. I would love to see it. So my dad meets with Bob and he says, you got to teach me how to fight. And Bob says, why? And he tells him why. And my godfather's like, holy shit, it's Muhammad Ali. Yeah. So he's teaching my dad, you know, how to fight. And they train for about three, four months. Um, and even after, um, all the way up to the point where he passed away and my godfather became my, my teacher. So I got to learn a lot about my dad from him too yeah. later in life. Um, and still to this day, he holds out his stories on me or he just forgets because he got punched a lot. <laughs> but uh, so my dad goes to Ali's house one day and Ali's peppering him just pop, pop, pop with this jab. And my dad's trying to slip the jab. And my dad gets a check hook in. Boom. And Ali, they're in the living room. They're not in the backyard. And Ali falls onto the couch like, oh, and falls on the couch. Gloves? No gloves? They're boxing with gloves. Right, right. My dad runs in the bathroom. He had bloody nose. He runs in the bathroom, comes out. He wipes the blood off Ali's face, jumps in his 75 metallic blue stingray and hauls ass home. <laughs> Ali calls the house, telling my mom, I'm going to kill that boy. You tell him I'm going to kill that boy next time I see him. My dad framed the towel with the blood on, like it's a war medal, on crushed purple velvet in a dark wood frame and then it has like a little uh, plaque thing on it. it says june 7th 1975 ollie's blood Do you have my, that? my mom has it i've asked for it a million times when i'm dead it's yours <laughs> but my mom still has it to this day man that is crazy yeah dude. did he ever spar with him again um yeah they sparred a bunch of times they, and ollie you know, would always pepper you him. know ollie got a couple of after he saw oh. a punch one time, he was like, that's not going to happen again. I never heard a story of my dad hitting him a second no. time. No, 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 no. <laughs> That's like, yeah. Ali wasn't impossible to hit, so he was just that good. That is, you know what's crazy? And then you go back to Floyd. Like, when you're, when you're so good that you are stopping other professionals from hitting you. Yeah. That's when you know. And you're, you're making them look like guys like you and me. Yeah, yeah. That's when you, <laughs> dude, I took. Like, I love Victor Ortiz, but Floyd made him look like. Yeah, I'd never seen him look in my life. I was like, "Damn, bro!" Are you as into UFC as you are into boxing? Yeah, my godfather was the first investor um, for Hori and Gracie when Hori and invented it. So tell me something smart for McGregor to go back against Diaz, because here's how. And I, I, you tell me, you know way more about it than I do. Here's my impression from watching that first fight: McGregor is a bigger, a more skilled fighter. But what he looked like is he just looked like he ran out of steam. He looked like he punched him as many times as he could punch him. And then he was like, this dude's bigger than me, he's stronger than me, and I'm out of gas. That's what it looked like. That's a part of it, but I don't think that's the main reason. Um, so I, I mentioned earlier, I trained with Wayne McCullough, yeah. and he's way into the Irish boxing scene. And what a lot of people didn't know 
when Connor was coming up is he was an Irish boxing champion. Dude, he throws hands. So his footwork is going to be second to none in the division. Dominic Cruz's footwork is amazing, mm-hmm. okay? But he doesn't set on both feet a lot, which is why he's not generating as much power on those knockout punches. Now, he doesn't need to because Dominic will hit you with seven punches, and right. that's what he's going for. It's a deliberate thing, but it's just to demonstrate the difference in uh, MMA footwork to boxing footwork. Connor's feet, he's not flat-footed. He's still in the balls, but he sets down on his punches, and counters you right. or will simply do that triple jab moving forward that for some reason no one else in the UFC will do and it's one of the most effective boxing well, techniques Well, because most of those guys don't start out as boxers. Right, and they don't use take advantage of the jab right, which right, is right. the best thing for any fight. I won't say he's the better fighter and it's not because he was smaller. Nate got 11 days to train. Nate boxes with dudes like Andre Ward. I know he looks awkward Yeah, but just because you look awkward doesn't mean you don't know the sweet science. He can box so big time. He the only th- when Wayne and I were talking about the first fight, and I even said this on on ESPN Los Angeles before their first fight, and I said this is from Wayne's mind, not mine. Yeah. He's a lot smarter than me. He said if Nate can take his punches, you'll know in the first minute, and if he can, the fight's over. Which is exactly what happened. Which is exactly what happened. Now, what Connor lacks is any legit jujitsu ability and any legit wrestling ability. His taekwondo. Top shelf. Right. His boxing, top shelf. His wrestling is garbage. And when he got hurt and tried to shoot a double, that was a double that like my six year old shoots. Right. You know what I mean? And yeah. I'm telling her, baby, no, that's wrong. <laughs> you know what I mean? So and, yeah. and he he has to acknowledge that. Right. Like it's not it was not a good shot. You don't shoot with your head straight down. So does he have a <laughs> shot? This this I don't know what the plan B is. Like they show videos of him training and it's his trainer punching him in the stomach a million times. I'm like when did Nate do that the first fight? Right. He choked you the fuck out, bro. You need to be working on hip escapes, wrestling, and avoiding a takedown, dog. At 20 dog. pounds lighter, there's a reason there's weight class divisions, right? Do you have a shot I mean, against the Hoist dude? Gracie didn't have an issue with it in the original UFCs. And granted, the fighters it's weren't where diff- they are now. Yeah, it's different. But it's there different. is that philosophy that exists. And a jiu-jitsu right. fighter would debate you on that big time. But a jiu-jitsu fighter is not what McGregor is. No, but that's what Nate is. Right. Nate is so I'm saying, uber black belt. If you're like, a, if uber you're a boxer belt. if you're in your and you're basically don't shoot <laughs> don't shoot but also don't fight somebody who's 20 pounds heavier than you right yeah but i mean i feel like the box like the jujitsu's philosophy is every fight goes to the ground and boxing doesn't teach you how to fight on the ground no the boxer's philosophy is everyone has a button and if i touch that button you're going to sleep I so do, that's the debate like I do that's agree what makes that. combat sports fucking awesome and that's what makes it the best sport in the world is it's I say my boxing's better than your wrestling, and right. you say fuck you. And okay, let's find out. And there's no, there's no question at the end of it who won. Like Max Kellerman, the boxing analyst, has By this the way, great, great dude, and he knows his shit. Dude, he has a great comparison that he does for sports. He says, say you're standing in the middle of the street at an intersection with no cars because we'll be safe. On uh, one corner, Pele is doing sweet dribbling with a ball. Yep. On another corner. Uh, uh, Steph Curry's doing, you know, sweet, sweet moves. On a third corner, the best uh, golfer in the world is hitting drives. And on the fourth corner, two dudes are fighting. Where's the crowd? Like, everybody's going to watch yeah. two guys throw the fuck down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's why pro wrestling still exists today. Because even if it's choreographed, people want to see man versus man, woman versus woman, denim versus spandex. As long as it's... Denim versus, versus spandex? It's on. Well, I missed Wait, the 90s. <laughs> I mean, den- denim versus spandex. I missed the 90s, that, that boy. That actually sounds like a Prince band. Like a band that he that tried to put together. <laughs> oh, on his label that Warner never, Brothers never took away it. from like, him? It's like, cold-blooded. He, he was like, hey, I got an idea for a band called Denim versus Spandex. What was the name of his other label that he just would put girls that he was sleeping with through? What was the name of that label in Minnesota? I think it was called Prince's Dick. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, that I, I took Krav Maga for a little while. That's the J. Yeah. Okay. And I used to spar. And this is when I knew that it wasn't just size. It's not just size. Oh, no, no. Leverage. Or leverage, strength. Leverage, yeah. It's, do you know what you're doing? Yeah. Right? So it was, I, Okay. We went, went to, showed up the sparring class, and it was three guys and three girls. So the guy running the class set it up with two girls, two guys, and then me, and I was going to spar with this woman. And I was like, hey, man, I don't, um, I don't know how I feel about sparring with her. Right. And, and he goes, just put your gloves on. <laughs> right? So I say to her, like, I'm sitting down next to you. her, right? And we're <laughs> wrapping our hands, and I say to her, hey, just so you know, I'm not going to hit you. And she goes, I know. 
Now, when she said I know, it was I thought she was acknowledging that I didn't want to hit a girl. What she was saying was, No. I've seen you fight. <laughs> You're not gonna fucking touch me. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> I throw a jab. I miss her. I throw a jab. I miss her. Because I'm just trying to in my mind, take it easy on her. Yeah. You ever had a front a leg kick to your thigh? Yeah, a Muay Thai leg kick. I fought that Muay Thai for twelve years. Fucking it takes the will to fight away from the guy you're fighting. Yeah, because when by the way, the leg kick is the best street fight move there oh is. Oh my god. Because it makes the guy that wanted to look tough suddenly go Because Ow! you can't put the pressure down <laughs> yeah, on your it kills. So she hit me with three really have fun with that and And you don't know how to leg check i didn't know how to leg check. (laughs) so she had seen me spar before that's right i was sparring with people way below her level so she had eyed me out and been like oh he if i ever fight him i can do this i'm hitting him with a leg kick that's cold-blooded so i couldn't put my front foot down because by the way did you put your arm down to block one (laughs) <laughs> then she threw a hook and yeah. knocked my mouthpiece out that's across what, the room. That's what we do, too. And then so they blew. The guy rang the bell, and he was like, you can't fight her. <laughs> she beat the shit out of me. The bruise on my leg, dude, yeah. was a fucking real I deal. I remember the Muay Thai days, man. So the guy who was the referee. But Muay Thai, by the way, is vicious. It's it's rough, man. That leg kick's no joke. And they build up that calcium. Yeah, we there. would get a stick, and we would whack our shins and then roll. And the guy who was the referee from the first Karate Kid movie, his yeah. name was Pat Johnson. We just called him Master Pat. That's the dude that taught me how to leg kick when I was like five years old. Dude, <laughs> I got have spoiled. You, have you done one of those? To somebody? A million of those, like in New Mexico, when like gangs would try to rank you in because it was a big time gang problem in the in the in the nineties, big time. Because a lot of the 18th Street Crips from LA went there because it was easier to get drugs across the the Juarez border than right. the Tijuana border. Um, and so guys will fight. You hit a guy with a leg kick with the sharp part of your shin, and they reconsider fighting you real quick. I've had literally guys, I think I was maybe 15, 16, yeah. at a putt-putt as a miniature golf place yeah, in yeah, Albuquerque. Yeah. And this guy was big and hard and tough, and I cracked him with one leg kick and literally made him say, man, fuck it, and he split. No, you can't <laughs> like, do anything with it. It takes the will to fight from someone who's not used to it. Now it's a more common thing. No. And now if you fight somebody and you see him do that, you're like, oh, this fool might know what's going with on. With a leg check. With a leg check. Yeah, yeah, but if you get caught with a good shin coming down at that right angle, at the, mm-hmm. the correct angle, it almost feels like it cuts through your muscle. That's and what then when like they know me. they hurt you, they fake low and go high with that kick, and then it's sleep, sleep time. Here's what she did. <laughs> she was super nice to me, and she didn't kick me in the face, but she yeah. punched me in the face. That's good. And when the mouth You got headgear on, right? Yeah. Or Krav Maga was like, we're tougher, we don't need headgear. Well, Krav Maga was interesting, <laughs> because you know what? I had never been to a fighting place where the guy was like, hey, I go, was that fair? And their rule is, there's no such thing as a fair fight. A, yeah, street fight is you do what you got to do. Yeah, yeah. The, the guy that taught me, he was like, listen, I can't teach it in class. But you know the eye gouge is very effective. <laughs> <laughs> and you're I'm like, like really? Yeah, like, uh, okay. That's so what you're <laughs> poke him in the eye, Ric Flair style? Boink. Fuck yeah. Woo. <laughs> How many fights do you think you got into before you left me- New Mexico? Uh, that I was fighting a lot. So really? Yeah. Did you, did you, but when you came out here, that stopped? I've been in three fights since 1994. But I spar like three or four times a week. Um, you but, still love it? Yeah, man. It's I teach my kids... You know, I, I'm down at Gloveworks. Come spar with us. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, guys will, most of the time, are pretty chill. I had a, I, you, know, you don't say names in the gym, but some kid who's 19 years old kind of called me out at the gym. And I was tired, man. I'm like, man, this kid wants to go. I looked at Wayne, and Wayne just looks at me. And goes, he just nodded his head. I was like, yeah, all right, dude, come in. I'll put it on this kid's body so bad, he literally just gave himself to me against the ropes to where I literally... Was it just boxing or everything? Just boxing. Yeah. And I put it on his body so nice that he was not going to fight back, and I tapped him on the shoulder to back off because there was yeah. like 30 seconds left. And Wayne yells, don't stop, that's what he wanted. <laughs> <laughs> so I peppered him up a little more, uh. and this, uh, this <laughs> UFC fighter... This UFC fighter comes up to me like five minutes later. He goes, you know that kid's still puking in the bathroom, right? Uh, I was like, oh, you just made a 40-year-old feel so fucking good. The bro. body shot can change somebody's yeah. decision it, to fight, too. Oh, yeah. That liver shot's no joke. No joke. Forget a liver shot. Just when you get a body shot at, or even someone hits your stomach, you're not expecting it. Oh, yeah. Oh, hard to look tough. It hurts. When Wayne has mitts on and he's just like playing with me, he'll just touch me. On, and I'm like, dude, that honestly hurt. Don't do it again. <laughs> Listen, I'm paying for this session, motherfucker. For real. Like, it's tender down there, bro. 
tender. I'm not a tough guy, uh, man. I don't like getting hit. That's why I dodge. You do teach. So you're teaching your kids? Yeah, man. Um, I, I try to do a lot of work, not just with my kids, but um, I've worked with autistic kids. Yeah. Uh, Does that help? Well, jujitsu is really good at getting you comfortable with closeness, like a crowd McGraw uh, would do or yeah. like an amateur wrestling would do, which is something a lot of uh, kids with Asperger's and, 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 and autism struggle with. And I've, I witnessed it with this UFC fighter, Brian Ortega, who was the guy who helped me get my blue belt back mm-hmm. in the day. And now he's an undefeated UFC fighter. And I watched him work with this non-communicative uh, autistic kid. And he didn't know what to do. It was jujitsu that did it. Um, he got to be sort of the tool to, to, to turn the bolt that made everything click for this kid. But the kid couldn't speak to him. And finally, Brian just pinned him down the way you would pin someone down. Yeah. He said, do you want me to get off you? And, and I see this little boy. He's going, Argh! And he goes, you want me off? And he goes, Argh! And he goes, put your hand right here. And he puts his hand on his wrist. He goes, put your other hand right here. And the boy puts his hand behind his elbow and he goes, squeeze hard. And he squeezes hard. He goes, now hook my foot. And he helps the boy hook his foot. He says, now make a bridge. Make a bridge. I won't say the boy's name. Yeah. Um, and the kid makes the bridge and he flips Brian over and I watch. How old's the boy? Uh, he's a third grader. So however old you are in the eight, eight. Yeah. Um, he flips Brian over and Brian had been working with this kid for three months. Kid had never spoken and he yells as better than I do. I did it. And I see this tough guy. I'm not going to say that cause that happened in the gym, but he was very moved by what this young How could boy, you not be, dude? by what this young boy did. And I was like, yeah, I got to do that. Um, so I started working a lot of that and then I'm trying to start a program for, uh, veterans and for kids. Um, cause I had a lot of family that served one of my best friends. I do jujitsu with served one of my other best friends is active right. in the Marine Corps and they all do jujitsu. And I want to bring that to the veteran center over on the West side instead of a hedge maze. How do you feel like that helps? I think again, the, the comfort with closeness is good. I'm also want to bring Wayne and some of these old school martial arts guys because Bruce Lee said it best. Martial arts is the physical expression of what we love and hate most about ourselves. And his students, he found, came to him because they had shit going on that they could not verbally communicate because there were walls there. And martial arts brought all those feelings out. Yeah. And I'm a big... I know that sounds like Eastern hooky dooky. No, dude. Sorry, I was raised by Bob Wall, so yeah. that's what I believe. But and we I've all, seen it work. We're so a big I, fan of hooky dooky here. Hooky dooky's good, man. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> big, so, fan hooky-dooky, big fan of the hooky dooky. Big fan of the hooky I've seen your high walks. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Love the hooky So, you know, being raised on that and and like I also... This sounds way on the opposite end of the spectrum. But I do something called Twitch where you play video games and yep. so people can watch you play and see what you're playing and they can communicate and speak with you, um, whether they're just fans watching or if other people online want to play the game you're playing, you can communicate with them. And I, I speak with a lot of veterans, oddly enough, on there who use video games as a tool and have already like communicated directly with them, like, come down to L.A., man, come roll some jujitsu with me, come see how it feels. And they've all talking, spoken to me about PTSD, talking, spoken to me about PTSD and things like that and how they felt that could be cool. So I'm trying to bring those guys down, too. And all the guys I roll with are like, dude, come roll for free. Like, you know, they're just they're It's a good not only skill to have, but again, like Bruce Lee said, it really does help with confidence, with fear, with, with uh, discipline, with all those things, 100%. man. So I'm a huge proponent and that's my soapbox. I, I will tell you this. And by the way, you're a complex dude. You're a complex dude, man. Like you you've, 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 you've feel you, pretty simple. Actually. Yeah. But you've ex- <laughs> because of all the different things that you've experienced in your life. I definitely got to be raised. It seems like you came out the other side with like, this is what's important to me. This is what's important to me, and this is what's important to me, and the rest of that shit, I don't, I'm not gonna worry about it anymore. It, it's funny. I I did an interview with Howard Stern, like right in like what, what year was I cool? Like ninety seven, ninety eight. It's cool. Right it's cool there. still right now. All right, we're rocking the nineties still. <laughs> so, and he was talking to me about how he said, "What would you be doing if you were an actor?" I was like, "Man, I just you know try to open a restaurant, play video games, be married with my wife." He's like, "Man, you and Sarah ain't gonna be together." Yeah. And, in seven years, I'll bet you. And we bet a million dollars. He still hasn't paid me, by the way. We bet a million dollars on the air that uh, Sarah and I would still be together. And I look at my life now. We've been together 15 years. I wrote a cookbook. Um, I had this. Cr- Are you happier now? Yeah. Like I, I, I cooked for Mario Batali and Michael Simon on their show. And in the commercial break, um, they both came and spoke to me about some really cool stuff that would be like if you wanted to play football 
and Vince Lombardi gave you a pep talk. Yeah. And you'd just be like, what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> I, think I, can, I think I can do this. <laughs> so those guys at the break showed me a lot of love, and, and I've been talking to them about a few different ideas now, and they've been really good to me and, and, and passionate with, with my ideas. And so I've known who I wanted to be for a long time. I, I chose to act to sort of rightfully or wrongfully, however How you feel you about act? my grandpa. Uh, I moved here in 94, and I, I stopped when our – I pretty much stopped when our daughter was born. I mean – I shouldn't say this because I don't feel great about it, but they pay a lot of money in Hollywood. So I did a few jobs where I was just like, man, I can't say no. No, no, no. no, no. You, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. But And I've, my, I won't say the movies because I love those directors and writers and I don't want to like dump on anyone. But I did a few others after I was done with one foot out the yeah. door. And then once I could step away clean, I stepped away clean so I could be a full time dad. I have responsibilities to to certain kids, like I said, um, and I don't break promises to kids. I'll break a promise to a grown-up. That don't mean shit to yeah. me. But a kid, you can't do that, man, because that's, that scars them and sours them uh, for life. At least it, it did to the people who, who couldn't keep them with me. So, uh, so that stuff became really important, and I threw my life into that and a surfboard, and, and things got better quick. But, then listen, <laughs> this is the first time you and I have ever met face-to-face. -face. Yeah. But what strikes me about you is that you do seem – extraordinarily present and uh the word i'm gonna use the word calm like mo yeah i will tell I you that feel, yeah that i agree with for there sure. are a lot of people in this town and i'm sure you know a bunch of them a lot of them are my friends <laughs> and they're, they're constantly <laughs> they have, fidgety there's yeah. no they I worry about their heart rate peace. Yeah. yeah but you seem very at peace and calm dude with how the path clearly was a little bumpy getting you here but yeah, like, oh yeah you don't if you work everything out by the time you're 20 god love you but who you does gotta that? be lying to yourself yeah. somewhere on that yeah. road it, you know it took me a long time but when did I had, you realize you did not love acting um you know i did a movie with parker posey that made me love it um and so for a good five years why was what a, was that experience she's Parker Posey vomits energy wherever she goes. And if it hits you, you're infected. Like you just can't, That's you just amazing, can't dude. help it. Like she has this, I was maybe 19 when we worked together. It was a movie. It was called the house of yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark Waters uh, adapted it from the play and directed it. He did mean girls and, and other stuff as well. And uh, I was in love with her. I wanted her to be, my girlfriend, my sister, my mom, like my acting coach, my everything. It's like crazy I wanted, combination. Yeah, like I wanted <laughs> her to be every part of my life. And I feel like most people when they meet her feel the same way because when I talked, I've talked to like Jimmy Fallon a few times. We be, became friends on uh, SNL when I hosted that a long time ago. And right when they first started dating, I was like, man, I just had this weird vibe. He goes, dude, I feel the same way. You know what I mean? It was just like... <laughs> It's just she has this aura about yeah. her, you know, and that made me fall in love with it. And unfortunately, that was my first movie. And then, uh, you know, as I got older and, and I, I saw more of that it was like my uncle always told me. And I told you he's the smartest guy I know. And he was my dad's manager. He always would say, Freddie, it's show business and business is the bigger word. Yes. And when that kind of I was old enough and experienced enough to understand that. I said, yeah, I need to pursue stuff I love. And that was sort of when the plan started. And it took me probably three years to, uh, to get on board with the plan that, <laughs> that I was trying to get on. But once I did, I didn't, I didn't look back. And I felt really, you know, and I've been calm for a while. But once I had kids, everything. That changes everything. Yeah. Then all of a sudden, all my priorities in my top 10 were like. Phew. You know, I, I, it, that's what happened to me. People would, like I would, uh, with Mo Jacob. I used to have to because I was single at the time. I used to have audition with him in in asleep in, in, yeah. in a baby little Bjorn. Dude, I brought my little man on a on a voice yeah. recording thing, and he. I was like, "You gotta stay quiet." And when I finished, he goes, "I quiet that." Yeah. I was like, oh, yeah. So at two, because I I would do my lines in front of him. At two, he could sit next to the casting director and know when to laugh. So I would do the I would hit the joke, Dude. and he'd be like. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's money. We walk out. I'd be like, "You killed it." He's that's like, next yeah. level, right there. Nailed it. Nailed it. I will tell you something. Also, I'm surprised I haven't seen like single father actors pulling that move. Oh, <laughs> it's such a like. If you you shouldn't have said that on it. You need to mute this part of the show. That's a gangster move, well, right? Now there. it's not as gangster. He's like a grown person. No, I'm saying for other actors out. Oh, there. I tell people all the time. <laughs>
bring your kid. You know what I used to do? Because my cousin is a kid. And it'll distract your opponents in that, there. Because remember, to... the union is not a family. <laughs> what? Can I tell you something? You know what I did used to do? My cousin is a guy named Scott Wolf, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. And so during Party 5 at one time was the biggest show. Yeah, for like five years, right? bro. <laughs> not at one time. It was there, a huge show. There was one time there was this audition I really wanted. I go, hey, Scotty, will you come with me? And he's like, why? I'm like, just because when you walk into the room ahead of me, people are going to be like, what That's the right. fuck is this guy doing Throws them off their game. <laughs> <laughs> such a Boston move, dude. That's such a Boston dick move. Oh, my God. It's oh, money. I wish I would have thought so of it. I had him go in ahead of me like a couple minutes. <laughs> and you could see people get in there. And they were like, he, was, he, hot. Si- he signed in. He signed. He you had him signed sign. In. So they would come up just to make sure to see if it was. Oh I'd see God. they'd come down and check the list and be like, "Fucking Scott." Whoa. That's like mob. St- <laughs> oh. hey, by the way, you guys are dicks. I didn't book one of them. <laughs> it's still a great I, move, I bro. I didn't, it's still book, a I didn't great book one. Move. Of them. And I will tell you something. And I, I don't know if I've, That's if, funny. if anyone's ever mentioned you this before. My brothers and I, all, and I have three older brothers. We all will say unequivocally. That the first Scooby Doo is the most <laughs> underrated comedy of all time. Really, dude. And now maybe because my my expectations were low. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Now the truth comes. But when out. we sat in the theater and we were high, yeah, I walked out of the theater with my three brothers, and I'm like, that was fucking hilarious. You know, the writer um, James Gunn, who's now Guardians of the Galaxy famous, yeah. his original draft you guys would have gone bananas for. Um, it was a movie for stoners, dude. It was supposed to be. And then we got a new draft when we landed in Australia. Ah. And uh, the Warners conveniently waited until we landed You filmed in that in Australia? Yeah, the first one. Um, I'll be honest, I haven't seen the movie. <laughs> I read the script. I know how it ends. <laughs> I've only seen three jobs that I've ever done. Like, it just... I, I have to tell you... Premieres on, make me awkward. I completely get it. I've been on... I was probably on over 250 episodes of Chelsea. How many did you watch? I've seen one. My wife told me to say hi because we used to always crack the hell up. I mean, first I've of all, one. whoever chose that squad that you guys ran with. Her. She did? Her. Okay. I hope she hears this. You're fucking awesome. And the level of talent comedians that you brought up. This isn't for you. This is for her. Yeah. <laughs> was. I put the mic down. So right. awesome. Like it. She made you guys the stars of the damn show, and it was up to you to sink or swim. Yes. Like a Marvel superhero, yes. not a DC superhero yes. where you're protected. Yeah. <laughs> it was deep into the pool. They don't like him. Off with yes. his head. And when you guys would shine, man, like my wife and I would sit and crack the hell up, and it made us follow a lot of you guys, not on social media because I didn't have it back then, right. but when you guys would perform. Yeah. like We would want to know about it, and we would want to see it. And I'm so stoked to hear you say it was her here's what she did there were shows and this was the best part about her and i know people have their own opinion about her and whatever whatever i think she's funny as hell she's funny as fuck do you need another water buddy i'm cool right now all right let me know um here's the best thing about her her ego say what you want but most people in her position would make sure that she had the best joke and yeah. always ended with the best joke. A lot of insecure people it. would do that. Yes. She's not insecure. She's not a beta per- She's not Sally Field. She's not, you like me. You really no. like me. Like Sally Field wasn't sick until you, she won an Academy yeah, Award. Yeah, yeah. But so many of the people in Hollywood are beta personality, meaning yeah. they're so susceptible to con- compliments and criticism. She's an alpha person. She's Kobe Bryant. Kobe, you suck. Whatever. Yeah. Kobe, you're great. Whatever. Y- she way, already knows matter. how she yes. feels about the bit long before you do. <laughs> she, there was one show where she would read the topic and I remember specifically, I think it was me, uh, a guy named, it was me, Joe Coy. Yeah. It might have been me, Joe Coy and Ben Glebe. It was a good little group, Great right? squad, yeah. And we ran with the show and after the show, I remember saying to her, you didn't say anything. She goes, you guys were funny. I didn't have to say anything. That's money, dude. But that's what it's about, man. That's it. She didn't care who was shining. Is the show good? That's okay, what that's it's all about, that. man. There aren't too many people who would do that. You let the jokes dictate where the show... Yeah, man. Funny wins. Man. And that's how she always was. And by the way, like... I, and y'all had to fight it out. like Oh, dude. Because y'all were sharp, man. You guys and were sharp. Much like the Marvel superhero, <laughs> if you said something on there that wasn't funny... She was going to tell you. Yeah, you're done. She made Bobby Lee sit under the table. His first joke was so bad, right? 
Her first joke was so bad. She goes, Bobby, you're going to need to sit under the table for the rest of the show. That's right. My dad had a couple of bad jokes. And she was like, <laughs> he was like, no, not really. And she goes, Bobby, get under the table. And he <laughs> delivered because he's. That's had a his- better bit than the punchline yeah. he delivered. <laughs> That's so a Vince McMahon move right there. Him under the table. But I will tell you, I learned more from her and from, I had a chance to talk to Stern, but I, her basically message was, and this was so. It helped my comedy more than she'll ever know. Her message was, hey, fuck everybody else. Yo. Does it make you laugh? And if it makes you laugh, if you build it, they will come. Yeah. Do yeah. the jokes. That, pretend it's you and your brothers high in a living room. Tell those jokes. Yeah. Those jokes are, are true to you. She's, she's to you what Vince McMahon was to me. Like, Did he give you that? He would try to give everyone that, but... His demographic was so far removed from the talents that they didn't always understand the message. But he was trying to say what Chelsea would say to you guys. And so my job literally became at one point a translator. And he ran what he called a promo class, which was like an acting class. Wait, what did you do at WWE? Okay, so the first time I was there, I was a writer and producer, which basically means you have to do... And why? How did you get... Were you always a wrestling fan? Since I was a kid. And I always liked the bad guys because... We Who was your ha- favorite? Coco Beware? No, he was a good guy. <laughs> I, didn't, I did like JYD, though. Um, Junkyard Dog. Junkyard Dog Fuck was dope. Yeah. But I always liked the bad guys because the good guys only won on the pay per view. And because Vince's philosophy was always, we'll see the bad guy, you know, fuck him over, fuck him over. And right. if you want to see your guy win, you got to pay, um, which worked. <laughs> Smart. <laughs> became a billionaire. Um, so I always liked the guys that won every week because we were broke and I couldn't afford the damn pay-per-views. <laughs> so my favorite guys were Andre the Giant and oh, Ric yeah. Flair. And I hated Hogan and I hated the good guys. But Andre the Giant wasn't always a bad guy. Uh, not it? always. He became a baby face. That's their term for a good guy. Um, eventually, but during the Hogan days, he was the bad guy. Right. He was the heel. That's their name. So I always had love for it. I went to a show and one of the people who worked there who kind of organized me getting there, it was a WrestleMania. Um, she heard me. Macaulay Culkin, Snoop Dogg, and The Miz having a conversation about wrestling. What we liked and what we didn't. Right. And she liked what I had to say. Um, Snoop was pretty high. And, what? Uh, and, uh, I'm you know, so surprised Macaulay you say that. Was, Macaulay was Macaulay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I love you, bro. Enjoy, enjoy France. Um, I miss him. You come back. I enjoy France. It's one of my best, <laughs> my favorite throwaway lines that's ever been on this podcast, by the way. <laughs> Almost stepped in it. Yeah, that's cool. Um, <laughs> enjoy France. So she spoke to me about some of my ideas and opinions. She said, you know, would you ever consider, and I had just kind of stepped out of acting. She said, would you ever consider, you know, working for the WWE? I said, what are you talking about? And uh, she goes, just have a conversation with Stephanie and, and see what happens. That's Vince's daughter, Stephanie yeah. McMahon. And I had an apartment in New York that, uh, was in the same building as Shane McMahon, and I knew Shane a little bit, his son. And so I went up there, and we just talked philosophy, and she said, would you want to work here? And I was staying in my place in New York at the time, and their home base was Stanford, Connecticut. I took a 30-minute train to get there. And uh, I was like, well, well what, do you, what do you want me to do? And she's like, well, you would write, and you would direct, and you would kind of help my dad out. He's, you know, he tries to do like an acting class for him, but maybe you could, you could help. I was like, yeah, okay, let me, let me see. Yeah. And so I went, and I watched the promo class, and you know, he told these first two dudes, I don't want to say their names, but he made them come up and he says, all right, you're dogs. Now make me want to watch you fight. And it's dead quiet. And both guys are young in their 20s and neither one is a thespian. Right. So they're both like, I'm a fucking dog. Like they don't know what to do. And so the first guy, God bless him, man. He had the balls to go first. But he, instead of talking, he he barked. Oh, like a dog. Yeah, like a real dog. <laughs> and, Vince, and Vince gets up and he goes, what the fucking, not a fucking dog. And he just goes off. And the other guy, when Vince finishes his monologue, literally says, I think I'm having an out-of-body experience. <laughs> He's this Irish guy. <laughs> and so when it was over, he comes up to me. He's like, so what do you think of that? And I'm like, whoa. Well, you're using words like razzle dazzle and they don't know what that yeah. means. And I get the vaudeville thing. Wrestling is vaudeville. It's got a song break, a comedy bit, a magic. Yeah, thing. Like yeah. that's what it is. And he's like, yes, that's what it is. I go, right. But you didn't say that. Like you, you, you said razzle dazzle and told him to be a fucking dog. Yeah. And I said, look, I know what you want. You want them to be able to say, fuck it and not worry about failing on live TV. Cause if you're afraid you're going to fail, 
You will every time. Yeah. If you just say, oh, I fell on my face and the next day I woke up and everything was okay, you're going to succeed at just about every fucking thing you try. Fuck and yeah. that's what he wanted. And so, and this, they failed in front of all their peers, all the decision makers on their, car- on their careers, oh. like everyone. I said, hey, man, they're sensitive. The tough love thing's not working. Let me handle this. No cameras, no agents. The agents are like the, the bookers of the mm-hmm. matches and on the road are the most important wheel in the machine. Wait, so in different cities, there are different bookers? No, they travel all together as one massive company, one massive tour. How many people do you think? Hundred, probably over 200 people, easily. When, when, a whole crew, when a that whole comes roster. into a city, 200 people show up? Easy. Easy 200. That's not counting behind the scenes people, or it that's is? with behind the scenes. And the ro- the roster is almost 80 deep, bro. Like they don't travel everywhere every week. Almost, all of them. Some guy might get hurt. A match might change last minute. Hey, we're gonna give the young kid a push. Get his ass in there. It is fly by the seat of your pants. Really? Live TV. And I would be trying to wrangle these kids. And literally, I would do line reads sometimes because we would only have like 10 minutes. I'm like, do it how I do it. Boom, 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 boom. And he's like, okay, okay, let's start over, start over. And we would do it again. And then they'd go out and they would sink or swim. But when they would swim, man, I was able to do some really fun stuff there okay. that they hadn't done before. When, with, uh, I know the matches are, are clearly The endings are planned. Yes. How much... Is it chore- How much is it an actual dance? How much is it choreographed? I'm sure there are specific moves that are choreographed. Yes. But every single dance and th- punch and, and jump and kick can't be choreographed, can it? Every match is different. There's always going to be a few spots that they call, that the wrestlers have, a few combinations. Right. I throw you off the ropes. I knock you down. I run. I jump over you. You get yeah, up, You jump over. The big like, moves. There's some combinations that are all known, but they really let the talent, if they're able and capable, to dictate the terms and the story they want to tell. Hey, in man, the ring? Yeah. Hey, man, I'm going to work on your leg in this match. Okay, cool. You work the leg. And, and they I'll do it beforehand. They say beforehand. Yeah. And then they go in there and they bust out freestyle. Right. But they're, they're on the road 300 days a year working all these like techniques and dances and doing all this so a lot of it is ad-libbed on the fly no based shit. on how the crowd is reacting and sometimes like i'd be sitting backstage in the gorilla position and we'd give the him, gorilla position gorilla monsoon was like oh. he had the best seat in the house he was the old school oh, yeah, announcer that, by the way the gorilla position has a completely different meaning in my house uh, no this <laughs> this was like gorilla monsoon was yeah, yeah, yeah. the voice yeah of whenever the i tell my wife go get in the gorilla position oh God, it's a whole stop. different <laughs> that's a different but go ahead i go gorilla knuckle <laughs> deep um and that's a big knuckle but so sometimes you'll get more time in a match and and you'll convince to the referee, hey, we're pushing the commercial Monday night football went to commercial. So we're going to stay live. Give the guys another three minutes. And then the guys or the girls nowadays sometimes get commercial breaks and still time on the matches because their matches started rating higher than some of the guys. And so now you're really starting to see these people quite literally put blood, sweat, and tears on a canvas. But it happens on the to be able to do that. On a the lot fly, of it on the fly. You got to be dope yeah because you they must be talking to each other during the match you have yeah oh yeah there's like, communication like if somebody like has someone they're choking them from behind yeah. their mouth right next to their ear so they're like okay listen for the crowd all right here they come okay now fight your way up fight your way up fight your way up okay now i'm gonna smash you down again whoa all right now wait wait, yeah, you wait. got to right so there's stuff like that or like the old school veteran when they're teaching the kid when he pins him he'll be like you know, get up and, and act like you won. And it'll right. be one, two, and he'll just kick out at three, and the young kid will get up and be like, yeah! And then the old crafty veteran gets up and then gets the win. And that'll be an on-the-fly kind of thing, so long as the veteran was going to win the whole time. So there was, mo- like, there was an old-school guy named Larry Zabisco who oh, yeah. was famous for that, kind of just allowing the match to take, take shape organically as opposed to anything other than the finish but doesn't that lead itself and i'm all i gotta tell you dude what well, here's why i'm so impressed by these people mm-hmm. they're massive people doing gymnastics in a tiny little ring yeah. with another massive person also doing gymnastics and throwing hands and feet that hurt that hurt if you don't do it correctly and if you do Right, yes, yeah, yeah, I totally get that. <laughs> For real. But like, but, like, that's part of the dance, right? So you understand. You're putting people's careers in your hands but so multiple times per match. Yeah, yeah, how do I not see more or read about more injuries? How is that possible? You know, a lot of these, I'm sure you'll hear some- more about it on the indie scene, but on the major tours, you're dealing with professionals 
who know how to fall, know how to protect, and know how to keep their body where they need to keep it. How can they not, much like a football player, wake up? Wait, look, if you're three, they pounds, do. I mean, if, if, I, I'm, I'm they a, have a lot of the same issues football players they must, get. Because I'm 170 sure. pounds. I fell on the front yard the other day. I was sore for three days. Yeah. I don't know. The last time I hit the ground, I was like, oh, I haven't hit the ground in a long time. Bro, I've done nothing and just woken up and right. been it, like, my hammies are just shredded right now. What happened? Have you started making old man noises yet? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's I way. walk in rooms and be like, the fuck am I? When you reach for something, you're like, ugh. Oh, yeah. Oh, I've already been like, Charlotte, can you get the remote? Yeah. <laughs> Done that already. But these guys don't get enough credit for ath- the athletes they are, do they? No, but I think, you know... On a whole, if it's something that you don't understand or you don't like, the human condition is to shat upon it. Right. So it is what it is, but it's art. Like, they're not wrong. It's You can't be wrong. It's just like, I don't think Picasso is the greatest painter ever. I don't. I, think, I don't either. I think Amadeo Modigliani was way cooler, and I'm right. And if you like Picasso more, you're right. So it doesn't bug me when people dump on it. I thought it was funny when Connor said he would kill everyone on the roster. Yeah. Um, there's some big dudes. That ain't true. There's some, there's some big <laughs> and dudes. And there's some legit Are there some legit in fighters there. in there? Oh, yeah. There's Who guys, are the legit guys? I mean, there's a dude named MVP that if Connor rumbled with, would get his head ripped off. Who do you think <laughs> is the biggest? All right. You know. Okay. Who is the biggest? I had an uh, argument. It's not the right word, but conversation. The biggest wrestling star of all time. Oh. Is it Hulk Hogan or is it The Rock or some? The guy who I was talking to was like, "Is John Cena? He's bigger than any of them have ever been." Well, the, the ratings th- wouldn't agree with that. Are those the three biggest? Those would be the three biggest. I would say that with Stone Cold in there as a top five, and Andre because he was such a global legend. Legend everywhere he went. But does, um, has anyone done numbers like The Rock or no. Hulk Hogan? And ratings wise, would not say that Cena was more popular than The Rock because the ratings are, you know, a third of what they were when right. The Rock was wrestling. Now, there's a lot more channels now, and it's a different beast. But John Cena held that company on his back during a PG era that no one wants to admit to, but it was a necessary thing when you're a publicly traded company. Right. And he did it willingly, wantingly, knowing that he would get crapped on, knowing that people cutting promos on him would be like, your matches are on early because all your fans are asleep by the time the show's <laughs> over. Like, Triple H <laughs> cut that on him in a promo. And it's like, he married the boss's daughter, so you can't even say shit back. You're just like, oh, I got to take that. That was like when that rapper, I think it was Cannabis, tried to talk about LL Cool J, and yeah. he's like, 90% of your fans are all women. And LL yeah. returned with like, 90% of your fans don't exist. Yeah. Like, <laughs> He got yeah. to have a comeback. Yeah. John Cena yeah, didn't get yeah, to have yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. So to take that much abuse, and people would crap on him all the time, and they would hold up these signs at every match. They have Cena wins, we riot. But I never saw those pussies riot once. I shouldn't even call them pussies. Pussies are strong. They push out babies. Yeah. Whatever you guys were, you're weak, and you never rioted once. Tell me what Twitch is. Okay. I, I, th- I, don't, I don't think... Now, I did not get caught with the video game craze. I'll get... You're a lucky man. I will... You know, I'll play my son. I, has, I see a little action over there. My son loves it. Right? <laughs> That's right. He loves it. Your and son I, knows about Twitch. I don't mind playing a little uh, whatever, Mortal, not Mortal Kombat, whatever the fighting game. Okay. And I just press all the buttons all Mortal once. Kombat's a great game. My son hates you're, playing You're me. what's called a button masher. That's what he said to me. Yes. He goes, I can't fucking play with you. I'm like, why not? He goes, you just mash all the time. So if you beat him, like someone said that to me once during a Twitch stream and all I came back with, he's like, I, he goes, this is what it's like playing with you. And he just tapped all his buttons yeah. and you could hear. Tick, tick, tick. I go, yeah, that's Morse code for I just whipped your ass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't say shit after no, that. <laughs> but you know what I do like about it? Because I'm not a big video game guy, but I do love talking shit. Yeah. It's a great venue for that. Is it a great venue for it? And I love, like, I love talk. Like, I made a black dude in New York on a basketball court leave and not come back. Like, I will talk, because I'll know real quick about your family, about your dad's situation, about your mom's situation. Dude, it's, it can't be. It, I can go in. <laughs> now, do you have brothers and sisters? No. See, that's surprising to me, because I, now I have three older brothers, but most single, like, uh, only children that I know aren't great at talking shit because. It wasn't in their house all the time. See, my wife would sum this up, and my and this is thanks to my godfather, basically, because when people talk trash, she always goes, you don't give a fuck about no. like, what anyone says. I'm like, no, nah, I don't. Like, even if they go, hey, you're awesome. I'm like, yeah, cool. Yeah, That's yeah. cool. <laughs> I, don't, I don't care. So no matter what you say to me, like, I just think, okay, 
If he's saying that, he thinks that that'll hurt me because he knows it'll hurt him. So I just go deep in on the psychiatric tip on everything people say. And most of the time, you'll find out you're right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that just smashes guys. But the fun ones are like when you're playing kids. And they're like, damn, my name's Cheeks Jr. Uh, Chico, Cheeks Jr.? It was Chico Jr., right, but right. I got tired of hearing all the racist bullshit every open lobby I'd go in. <laughs> so I changed it to Cheeks. And, uh, you know, when you get like 12-year-old kids who get real mad at you, and I'm like, hey, man, I'm talking to your mom right now about getting rid of your Xbox Live account because you just ain't good enough. <laughs> and these kids will be like 12 years old well, you and must have ruined worse. their fucking oh, day. Yes. They'll send me messages in-game, which means you had to stop playing video games, <laughs> open another window... And without a keyboard, with a joystick and button, select every letter that you wanted to write to me. I've affected your day, and it's the ultimate Can I troll. Tell you how much it's, you li- how much I enjoyed that you're talking shit to twelve year olds oh, makes me laugh. Yeah. My son said the same thing. That's how like, the old '80s movies were. The grown-ups were mean to the yes. kids, man. Richard Pryor was mean as hell. He was Jack Brown, and he whooped a kid. He whooped him. I fucking <laughs> love that. Yeah. The, the talking shit is an art because I'm with you. If your last name isn't Wolf. You can't hurt my feelings. Yeah. I tell people, if, yeah. If like, I don't have, if you haven't earned my respect, mm-mm. it's really tough for, hard for me. the message to get through. I'll you, say, yeah, right on. Yeah. Or, you know what I mean? Do I'll you be know polite. What I find is a good one, especially for dudes online who troll. You know what gets them madder than anything? They'll say something. I always get, well, you fucking deal. There, this. I can tell you what the three insults for me are. D-list comedian. Okay. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't be anything without Chelsea, which. Is possible. Sure, I wouldn't be anything without my dad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like I, okay, Rock I'm okay. <laughs> I'm right, still I'm, cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I haven't seen you in any movies. I it, and my answer to all every guy, and this is what gets them so. These, the I call them little. Fe- Anytime you call one of those guys little fella, I'm like, don't worry about it, little fella. Little fella, pipsqueak. Little like fella. That. Hey, little buddy. Or little buddy. <laughs> Oh, hey, it drives them fucking crazy. <laughs> oh, that's your best comeback as a comic? Oh, you seem mad, little guy. Dude, the, the ones I get will be like, guys will be like, oh, well, I jerk off to your wife. And I'm like. Me too. Like, bro. Yeah. <laughs> Your, your, your knock on me is that you jerk off to women you can't get, but I can? Like, how am I? I'm laughing at you, dog. Like, what was that? Your knock to me is that my wife's good looking? And likes me and would never <laughs> like you? All right, bro. Good luck to you. Good insult. <laughs> like, I don't understand how those things hurt. But, you know, like, I guess it does a lot but, of but, but But it goes back to, like, beta and alpha. Oh, definitely, Doesn't definitely, it? definitely. Because was there a point in time in your life where it would have bothered you? As a teenager, maybe, but you, but then you were I was exposed. Early. I was exposed to my godfather's way of, of life real early on, and when I listened to what he said, things worked out for me. And yeah. when I didn't, they didn't. And I would go to him when I had a hard time talking to my mom about things because I was prepubescent and wanted to, like a man to, and he was the toughest guy I knew. Yeah. Um, and I would tell him and he'd say, well, did you do this, this and this? And I'd say, no. And he'd go, there you go. And it was always a real simple thing. Like it hurts when I do this. Don't do that. You know what I mean? And it just, and you hear that a million times. Eventually you go, oh yeah, a car is built to get you from point A to B and anything it does for you outside that is making up for character. You think you lack, you think I made that up? No, I've heard that a thousand and one times. Yeah. And so I can just say it by rote. Like, and so I drive a fucking toyota forerunner from 2011 that's got ninety six thousand miles on it i love the because it runs like a g yeah you know what i, I mean love the forerunner, and i've dude. never bought like fancy cars i like old cars you know me i get some old cars but i've never cared about all that crap and a lot of that is because of him all right i'm gonna ask you a question that i just thought of and because look obviously a male a male role model growing up for a boy is super important oh yeah okay do you think somewhere, because I do have a couple parenting questions for you, mm-hmm. and I ask everybody who's a parent, but do you think somewhere in you, you were like, A, I, for a while, grew up without a father. My kids are not. I'm stopping acting. I'm going to be home. That was, yeah, motive one, yeah. Is, was that motive one? Motive one. Where you were like, this is, I know how it was for me. That's not how it's going to be for them. There's no way in hell that I'm going to leave my children to go to London for six months to like do a Star Wars Kanan movie. Like right. I just, I would love to like people always, are you going to do a, a, a real version of the cartoon you do? I'm like, yeah. they'll find someone younger. Like <laughs> it's just not, and yeah. I love Star Wars. Like I've always said, there's like 
there's one role that I would come out of retirement for. And it would be if they ever did a Vince biopic. I would want to play a young Vince McMahon when he united all the wrestling territories and took over, like in the ancient Chinese empire, when he united the clans and formed one currency. Like, Vince studies this old shit. Does he? That's why he makes moves. He's hyper intelligent, yeah? Yes. And with no college degree, yes. And people think he's old and crazy. He's crazy like a fox. I spent two years with the man, like on his jet with him, side by side. I was on the road every single live show. Him? Oh, my God, man. Just about business in general. He would make me laugh. He would make me go, oh, what the <laughs> hell are you talking about? And he made me smarter. Yeah. You know what I mean? All those things. But I, look, my godfather always told me, take advice from people more successful than you. Don't take advice from your friends because they're fucking losers yep. and they're living month to month and they're drunk and their girlfriends cheat on them and they cheat on their girlfriends. So why would you listen to what your friends say? And you're like, well, because they're my friends. But when you say it like that, it sounds horrible. Yeah. And so I would talk to people who are always more successful than me. And instead of asking their favorite color, I ask them how they got successful. I, I got to tell you, when I, I had a chance to obviously I've used Chelsea a lot. I had Hell chance, yeah, man. I, I had a chance to talk to Stern for about 10 minutes. And it was the same thing. Like, I'm not wasting my time asking you your likes and dislikes for movies. I'm saying. How did you get where you were? So you, that was a decision, conscious decision for you. Yeah, you can't, you can't be a passive student. You have to be an active student. If you're not, and it's so easy with the internet and all these things, because information comes to us and we feel like it comes at a, a very accelerated rate. You should see how fast it comes to you if you go seek it out. Oh, fuck. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so that's how I was raised. Laziness was not allowed. Balance was important. My godfather would teach me with Gene LaBelle, the guy who taught Ronda Rousey's mom judo, was the first guy to ever choke me out. I got to train judo with him for an hour, and then I'd have to go garden for an hour <laughs> because that's what balance was yeah. to my godfather. That's karate and kid shit, dude, by the way. When you're a kid, that sucks balls, yeah. man. That's Literally, wax on, it's wax the off. worst. It is. Yeah. It was, and this was like before that damn movie even came out. <laughs> And so it sucked, but when you get older, you're like, wow, I'm doing that to my kids. Okay, <laughs> then that's my question, right? Because I ask everybody who's a parent because it's always fascinating to me. Okay, what did you... Okay, two, two things. One, wh- what do you hope that your kids do get from you and what do you hope they don't? That's the first question. <laughs> I'm already too late on the other one. <laughs> I, 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 I feel that way sometimes too. But what do you hope they do get from you? Um, I want my kids to know about confidence. I want my kids to know... There is no confidence without discipline, that it's always work. Yeah. Um, you don't deserve to shit. There is no in confidence life. without discipline is a great quote. Yeah, well, that's my godfather, not me. That's a f- um, I'm not great. that smart. But uh, I, t- I tell them all the time, you don't deserve everything. Everything you get is going to be what you earn. And yeah. sometimes even when you earn it, you still don't get it. Um, that's a great lesson, by the way. And that's good for any artist out there, yep. too. Um, so those are like the main things that I try to teach them because I want confident kids who can take care of me when i'm old yeah. <laughs> and and won't and won't and won't hate me and i told my son i was like hey you gonna you gonna wipe my ass when i get older <laughs> and he Dude, said i think you made out. some sacrifices like, no. that deserve a yes yeah, he said no. but you don't deserve anything but he, said, he so was like go. no and i go why he goes i'll, I'll hire somebody so, okay well that's almost yeah, the same i'm okay with that wiping by proxy yep. you're good <laughs> so what do you hope they don't is there anything about you you're like man i fucking hope they don't get that um i'm my mom would describe me when I was a kid as a shrinking violet. And, uh, really? I, yeah. Yeah. I was very shy as a kid and I didn't like meeting human beings. <laughs> 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 so, and my daughter takes a very long time to warm up to a room. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's so me. Um, and she wants to be alone a lot. Like I wanted to be alone a lot and I don't, I didn't want that for her, but I was happy. You know what I mean? I just, she has a brother, you know? Yeah. Um, and my son is the, uh, he's like, he walks in a room and he's like, what's up everybody. This is the booty gun. And he turns around and is like, and just sticks his ass. I do that too. (laughs) (laughs) So he takes after your side of the the family. He's part of the wolf clan. (laughs) So, you know, they're very opposite in, in that regard, but I teach them. I, and this is what I try to tell a lot of our friends who are having kids is like, Teach them what you knew best. So yeah. it's like for my kids, it's my daughter's been boxing since she was four. She's done jujitsu since she was four. My son's about to turn four. He already kind of wrestles, I, even though I shouldn't I teach him that. Um, I my son was a black belt when he was eight. In what? Taekwondo. Yeah, that's dope stuff. My godfather was a black uh, 
more than just a black belt, in Tang Sudo, which was the Korean foundation that the Chinese version of Taekwondo was sort of built upon. So there's is, some cool martial arts history. Is it less, is, is Tang Sudo, ta Taekwondo always struck me as kind of a dance. No, man, look, Taekwondo's legit, but I, I'll put it this way. Like, I have a black belt in Taekwondo, uh -huh. and I never lost a Taekwondo tournament because back then, no one knew how to use their hands. Right. Like, all you had to do was step inside and they would cover instead of punch because right. their first w desire, their first want is to kick because the hardest thing to forget is the first thing you learn. And Taekwondo teaches you how to kick before they teach you how to punch. Yes. The first thing I learned was the jab and that wins. <laughs> so especially in the tournaments, right? Especially in a tournament like a point system, but in real life too, you want your jab. If you don't have a jab, you really don't know how to fight. You think you do, but you really don't. And if you ever fight someone who does have a jab, you gonna lose. Ask Larry. Holmes. Why is that? It's the clo it's Bruce Lee would say it's the closest part of me to you. But it's not causing a lot of damage. Uh, Larry Holmes could put people on their ass with a stiff jab. Um, ask Muhammad Ali how that jab felt. Like really? it, it, it's no joke. And if I'm punching you, you ain't punching me. And if you are, you're not seeing me because you're seeing a jab. And that's when they come over the top with that right hand is when you react to that. So there's something called a feint. Yeah. So it's like if I jab you four or five times and it's keep popping your head back and you can't hit me, you get mad. And so when I jab, you start moving your head backwards or to the side. Now I'm going to fake like I'm going to jab. It's called a feint. And when your body reacts, now I'm going to throw a punch because you can't move any further back than you just moved. It truly is. And that's is. how guys get KO'd. Fighting truly is a chess match. The sweet science of bruising. That's what the old school boxers would call it. Eddie I mean, Futch would call it because that. Because you are, you are really... At the first round or two, you're trying to you're kind feeling of feeling them, them out. out. Yeah, what their tendencies that term are, from right? Howard Cosell, yeah, even back in the day. that failing but out process. You're learning their tendencies, so then, and you're seeing what they're reacting to. Oh, when I step forward, he steps back instead of to the side or to right. the other side. So now I can throw straight punches, and he's going to run out of real estate. So you can do all these things, or you say, "I'm going to leave this jab a little lazy because I want him to throw the overhand right." So when he does, I can duck under, and I got his body. So you're baiting people. Yeah, you're doing at, at all that level. You are like, if I'm going with a real legit guy, I keep it simple. Mm -hmm. If I'm going with a guy that is around my level, I'll be more creative. If they're below my level, I'm more just a teacher. But, like, if I'm going to spar with Tony, I would have to like – Tony Ferguson I'm talking about. Yeah. And this dude is, like, he won his last nine fights in the UFC. 25% of all the Darce choke submissions in the history of the UFC are his. What's okay? a Darce choke? A Darce choke is you're taking your arm over theirs, under their neck, and with your other arm, you're going over the shoulder oh, and then geez. grabbing your bicep. Um, the bicep, the bicep yeah. of the arm that goes How many over the deep shoulder. Are you at this time? I'm about four knuckles deep. <laughs> Ferguson's knuckles are bigger than mine. So 25 percent of all the choke, oh, and oh, there's a lot of them, shit. are his. So that's where I went to learn the darts because that's how I've been since I was a kid. Like my godfather, you're gonna learn how to kick. Shuki's gonna teach you because Shuki had the, in the Guinness Book of World Records the hardest kick in the world. So he's like, that's who you learn. If you're gonna learn judo, you go to Jean Labelle. If you're gonna lose, uh, learn jujitsu, you go to the Machados or you go to the Gracies. And like the, that was the philosophy. So when I saw Tony, I, God bless you, social media. Nobody says that. I found him on Twitter, reached out, we traded numbers, and the first thing he wrote, he's like, you're fucking serious? I thought you were joking, That's bro. That's amazing. I was like, yeah, bro, I want to come down. I was like, just don't try to kill me. He's like, nah, <laughs> dog, respect. I was like, cool, I'll see you in Costa Mesa. I drove an hour and a half, cruised down, and, no shit. and then trained down there, man. So all your belts, what, what, are your, what, have, what have you taken? You, taekwondo? Uh, taekwondo, Tang Sudo, um, Kempo, which no disrespect to Kempo, guys, is kind of martial combat sports have evolved beyond what Kempo sort right. of brings to the table. So it's a black belt, but I don't really count it. You black belt in all three of those? In those three, yeah. yeah. And then in jujitsu, I'm a blue belt with uh, three stripes. And then uh, I never belted in judo, but I trained judo for a long-ass time. Uh, I wrestled. Do you still have the taekwondo flexibility? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I can still get a leg up. Oh, yeah. Can you still can you drop into a split? No, without yeah. vomiting. <laughs> <laughs> My daughter's got some <laughs> sweet splits. Like, I almost puke from her yeah. doing the splits. I, I remember my but I'm tall, so I can still kick high. You, my, my, when my son was eight, he got a black belt in Taekwondo, maybe nine. And I remember we were walking in the mall over here, and he, for fun, would walk in the splits. He could walk in the splits and slide down and get himself back up and Dude. slide down and get himself back up. And he could do it in the side, too. What kind of tendons does this child have? He can't do it anymore. Okay. <laughs> there was one point in time. He's not a freak of science. Where I was fucking around with him. He was like 10 at the time. 
and uh, I was talking shit, and I was like, don't, <laughs> don't make me. He, he was someone about cleaning his room, and I was going over the top. Like, yeah. like don't make me come in here and make you, right? He's and like, I turn yeah, around, come in here. <laughs> and I tell my wife, I'm like, and I'll have to come back in here. And I, when I turned around, he had just, <laughs> he had his foot up right where my yeah. face was. Just, and he had kept a perfect pose there. Yeah. And he was like, don't turn your back. And I go, good idea. Did you like Neo did oh, Mr. Smith and oh, Matrix? Yeah, I was like, holy <laughs> shit. Put the kick on you and then just showed you the foot. Yeah, like, showed me the that's foot. That's the foot that's going to do you in. This is, is this your boy? Is this, this the, the foot right this here? This is my this is my son, Jacob. <laughs> What's up, man? Freddie. Nice this nice is Riley. Freddie. Hey, how are you? You guys are still here? We're about, ha- we're about, nice we're about to hop up. We've been here for a half an, an hour and a half, buddy. Nah, like 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Good to see you. You good? Um, how this is the teeth? extended Tommy Chong 10 minute version. Mm-hmm. This is my, so this is the, he's taller than dude, me. Dude, how tall are you? Six, three. Yeah, you are, dude. Every bit um, of it. What's up? Wilt is still. All right. Well, we've, we've, an hour and a half, buddy. We did a good. It's pretty good for my rookie sesh. And you did really well. The mic was here 91% of the interview. I would give you interview 95. Podcast. Oh, thanks. What did I say? 90? You gave yourself 91. You had 91? to shot yourself a little bit. Right, I'll take 95. You're 95. Um, how did you... It's very relaxed. Was it... Oh, man. Uh, what were you... Let's expe- do it again. Yeah. What were you... Expe- I'm just out of curiosity. What were you expecting? The only podcast I do are Star Wars podcasts uh-huh. because I voiced that, that Jedi, Kanan Jarrus, on, yeah. the, on the cartoon. And so everything is so Force-centric. And they like me doing those because I've... Like, I'll take it deep on him and be like, you know, the emperor is aware of the force sort of auto correcting itself. Yeah. The force is about balance. And that's why instead of killing Anakin, which then the force would create more balance, he seduces Anakin to double his strength. But then what does the force do? Oh. It then doubles. It gives us Luke and Leia. It's way deeper so then there's than I balance was, again. Dude. So I'll go on those trips and yeah. like the Star Wars community is like, dude, <laughs> oh my, I never even what and they and so those are the only ones i do so yeah. when i speak with you it's like the only time i can talk about something that's not force centric or or so now if yoda can get there what is the midi chlorian count do you think i'm like four, four million it's four i have no i don't even know i will tell you but this is different so it's good it's a nice change i need balance here's what i love about i i, I and here's why i knew i was gonna like you the text you sent me, I was like, hey, man, you want me to come up to your house? You want to come to mine? And your text paraphrasing was, you know, our house is kind of the house where the neighborhood kids hang out. <laughs> that was all I needed to know about you. <laughs> that tells me that tells me so much about you, dude, because. And about them. They're loud. Yes. And about them. <laughs> but to be the house, because our house was too, growing up. That tells you, like, that's what's important. Oh, to you. dude, we do archery. That's like, we have this cool cider. Yeah. My daughter's sick. She shoots a bow and arrow. Archery? Like Katniss. Oh, she's a pimp, bro. I did when I was a kid. I grew up in New Mexico, man. Like, that's what you do. I mean, dude, there's... So the kids come over, they shoot bow and arrow, they swim in the pool, we throw down the <laughs> jujitsu mats in the backyard, I whoop up on them. Like, we have fun, man. There's only one question. I just want to be my godfather. That was my godfather's house in the yeah. valley and Tarzana on Donna and Ventura. Yeah. And that was their backyard and every kid came there because Bob was the man and yep. I just want to be the man, dude. I got one <laughs> question for you. This is the only question I, I wanted to ask you going in because I was curious because, like, I grew up and my parents are still married. Oh, my God. My parents are still married and they're still, you know, when I call them on the phone, half the, if I talk to them for 20 minutes, 15 minutes of it is them talking to each other. <laughs> did you take the trash out and into the yard? Yeah, took You're it good out. Son. Are you sure you did? I'm like, Fine. You got patience. You're a good son. My question. And this is the, I only had one question. And it was kind of a serious one. At, at what age did you forgive your dad? Because for you to be this happy, you yeah. had to have already. Oh yeah. 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 Right? Um, and, and, and I'll start that. By saying it took a long, long time. Yeah. Um, When my daughter was born, I said like all my priorities sort of flipped, Yeah. right? And acting wasn't even in the top 10. It just wasn't. Um, But, you know, when I was young, and kids who have gone through this will relate. Other people might think it's hardcore. Like my father's buried at Forest Lawn in Burbank. Yep. And I used to book jobs and then go straight like a Warner Brothers job, or when I had my show on Warner Brothers, I would go straight to Forest Lawn, and I would yell at him. I would cuss him out. I would be mad and pissed off that he missed out on all these things that I was doing for him. And it's hard to realize you're chasing a ghost in the chase. Yeah. 
Because you got blinders on and you're so focused on proving something. I don't even know what it was, but I knew I had to prove something. So there was no forgiveness for a long time. And then right around when I was like 34, right after my daughter was born, I I've just like Bruce Lee would say, be water. Like I felt like water. Like I went and I sat, I sat down on the bench and I just talked to him. It wasn't the first time we spoke. You know what I mean? Like I've had full on conversations right. with with him where he's straight up talking back, and and that ain't crazy voices in my head. Like it's just the way it goes. Um, and we talked, and I literally said the words, and that was the first time. I was probably thirty four years old. It was right a few months after Charlotte was born. Was there a release? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Like what's the 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 corny way is like the monkey off your back, but when. When you're a junior, like, uh, here's a better way to describe it. It wasn't so much forgiving him. I had to forgive myself, too, for putting so much, putting him on so much of a pedestal and not allowing him to be a flawed character. And so every disappointment was like times 10. Yeah. And so once I was able to forgive him, I could forgive myself for being such a hard ass on a ghost. You know what I mean? Like, how can a ghost say sorry? Like, how can a ghost be you know come back and be like yeah man i fucked up bro like they can't do that so once you forgive them i was able to forgive myself and you, that was peace you it, you had to learn something earlier than everybody else right now your kids think you're a superhero oh for sure for okay. sure so when i asked him, my son that the other day what age did you start to look at me as a person you never got the superhero Nah, man, I got the worst person. Like, well, yeah. I guess Vader would be the worst dad you could have. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, it depends. That's the whole. It's like uh, it's a movie about finding your father, and then yeah. you find out who it is. Yeah. Oh, it's Hitler. Yeah. Like that blows, man. Nobody well, wants that. I was really that. hoping it wasn't going to be Hitler. Well, like there's Hitler, Pol Pot, and then there was me. Yeah. Um, so I never got. I got a magical version of him, but it was never superhero. Right. Because. I saw the damage that it did to my mother. Yeah. I saw what a broken heart genuinely looks like. Not the heart of someone who's been cheated on, okay? Uh, there are people who are still married and, and they cheat and yep. they do what they need. Or they don't even call it cheating sometimes. Or maybe it's on the sly. Like, that's hurt, right? That can be a broken heart. But he shot himself on her birthday and we didn't really do birthdays because <laughs> they were horrible. Like, yeah. it just was so... There was no hero to me when I first moved to, to L.A. in 1994. I was at his grave three, four, five days a week, and it was very rare that we had a positive conversation. Like even if I booked a job, it was more, hey, just so you know, you missed another one, and I did great stuff in there, and it was better than what you could do. You know what I mean? Like there was this sense of yeah, let me show you yeah. – that I'll take care of the woman that you couldn't take care of and I'll never let mom work and I'll never, you know what I mean? So there was like this in your face kind of thing. Like when you're young and you want to cause to fight for, if you don't have one, you fight for the whales or yeah. whatever Greenpeace or, you know, wherever you got to go. I had a fight. It was within my own family. I didn't have to look Fuck externally yeah. for it. It was internal and I, and I fought and I lost for a long time and it wasn't until it goes back to Star Wars. It wasn't until <laughs> Luke Skywalker <laughs> was willing to not fight that he's able to beat Vader. And when I stopped having anger and when I stopped trying to fight a ghost, everything was chill, you. man. Peace, bro. Nice, nice to meet you. Nice where, to meet you too, bud. Love you too. Ah, thanks, bro. Where, where are you going? <laughs> you going to hang out at his house? Yeah. You too, by the way, may have the palest legs combination. So congratulations. Look at the two. So, oh, my legs are so white, they're like a light blue. But I feel like if they took their shirts off... <laughs> I could see their organs actually operating beneath the skin. <laughs> yeah. I can actually see your liver glowing through the shirt. <laughs> see you, Later. Love you. All right. Sorry for talking trash on your side. <laughs> no, no, no. You started it. I always talk trash. All right, good. <laughs> He's like, I already talked trash to my four-year-old. I'm like, you think you could do that, scrub? Boom. When he picks me up, and like, you know, my nickname for him when he picks me up, since we're Jewish, I call him my Juber. So I'll call him on the phone if I need a ride. I'm like, Juber, come get me at the airport. He's like, can you call me by my name? I just did. I just did. That's so Boston right there. I just did. I just called you, Juber. Didn't you hear me? Uh, it's fascinating. What I dude. said, that's what you are. <laughs> dude, I'm, 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 I'm uh, here's my, one of the things, and, and we're going to get out of here. But one of the messages that I love about my podcast is that I love people. I, I'm always interested in to hear how, what people's hardships were 
in how what their journey was to overcome them. Yeah. Because I think for people who are living outside of our business who think, oh, they fucking, they had a silver spoon or their life was easy. Or, for sure. Oh, it's not, it's, it's important for everybody in all walks of life to hear you have choices. And oh, everybody's no. life is hard. 1990 sucked. We got kicked out of our house. Yeah. Like, it, it, it wasn't and easy. <laughs> you could have taken a different path, dude. For sure. You could be a, a drug addict. For sure. And angry still right now. In Albuquerque, there's plenty of that. Plenty of that. <laughs> right. So, my, everyone saw Breaking Bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know that house. But, dude, you was on my made street, some Delica. choices, bro. Yeah, yeah, man. But I had a good support group around me. A lot of guys that don't have a father. You know, the, the preacher on Sundays ain't enough, man. You need somebody who lets you in their house. You can see how they treat their wife. You can see how they treat their children. And then that gives you aspirational vibes. A lot of guys don't get that, man. And so in that regard, I was, I was you know, more fortunate than, than some of my peers. But in other ways, it was way worse because when everyone knows your dad and then they're dead and the way they died is not a cool way, um... You know, that's the flip side of that. Yeah. It's like, yeah, your dad died in jail, but everybody knows how my dad died and they yeah. want to talk to me about it every day. And I'm 20 fucking three years old. Like I did a Jim Rome interview back when he was on like Fox back in the day, yeah. it's like 1996. And the first question out of his mouth was, hey, have you ever thought about committing suicide like your father? And it's like, what a, that's a dick. And like, to Dude, me, I'm like, question. I'm like, wow, if we were in the same room, I'm 24. Okay. I still had a lot of anger. Yeah. And I had a lot of fights under my belt. And if we'd have been in the same room, he'd have got hurt. Like, that was not the right age for me to be dealing with that type of an unprofessional question. Did you see it on your face? Have you seen that interview? Oh, yeah. I, and I no-sell it, right? Like, I try to be Andre, right? Yeah. And I'm like, no, no, no. I never, I never would think about that kind of stuff. And that's not really who I am. And I'm trying to kind of, like, educate through kindness. But in my head, like, the whole time, I'm like, I think this motherfucker's in Southern California and I got to find out where this studio is. Like that was the <laughs> only, and I've, and I've met and I've seen Jim since then yeah, and like yeah. had a positive conversation with him. But I even told him that I was like, yo man, had we been in the same room, like you'd have gone to sleep. It wouldn't have been no Jim Everett over a table. That was back in the day when he was doing things to get ratings. The Jim Everett stuff. And, all, yeah, and yeah, I told yeah, him yeah. that we were, we were at uh, what's the, Oh, what is that place called? on Ventura Boulevard. They got Jerry's like the Deli. La no, they got the Lavash Press, and it's like right next to Outtake Cafe. I used to eat there all the time, and that's where Outtake I ran into. Outtake Cafe, down in Studio City. Yeah, in Studio City, it's like a little yellow sign. Yeah, the where the the breakfast place. Yeah, what's it called? Uh, I See, you can't remember. With an M. Not Mirabella. No, it's like Mambo Chambo. But or they something. got some fucking great breakfast. They got potatoes. good food, man. The breakfast and potatoes there. A breakfast sandwich oh. is bomb. So that's where we talked it out and yeah. had it there. And he was like, oh, I didn't mean any disrespect. And like whether he did or not it was irrelevant. I was just trying to have a conversation, like get that off my chest. Yeah. Um, but yeah, man, that stuff used to like wreck me. I couldn't even talk about it. Like as a kid, you go to like my mom, you know, she did everything she could. She sent me to like counseling, group counseling. Yeah. And I would see everyone talk and my face would get redder. And, as, <laughs> and like you feel pressure, dog. It was like worse than going up on a talent show. You know what I mean? Like, and you have to follow the guy that juggles real sick. Yeah. And you're like, fuck, I got I jokes. I got to follow the guitar act? Like, it's, it's rough, yeah. man. And so then it would come to me and I wouldn't say anything. And then the shrink would just say the word father. Mm. And I would up and bounce. Like I couldn't even, because I would be mad at the doctor for embarrassing me. And right. I want to punch him out. And that's a grown man. And you can't, as a kid, beat up a grown man. That would wreck someone's life. You can. So you can, but you're not supposed to. That's some Mike Tyson shit right so, there. <laughs> well, I ain't Mike. <laughs> well, I ain't made iron either. But... uh but yeah, man, so it was real, real hard. But like with anything, the more you do it, the easier it gets. Or you can fake it till you make it. And then one day it slaps you in the face and you either let it go or you lose. And I was able to let it go based on, you know, the, the lessons that I've learned. Not everybody can do that. And it sucks. But that's the that's the the, the balls that life throws at you, man. On a side note. Yeah. A good breakfast sandwich is just about the best thing anybody. If you With make some Tabasco sauce, uh, to make a it a good spicy. breakfast sandwich is hard to beat as something off of a menu. And that place, what is it called? Fuck when I'm driving home, I'm gonna be like, da -da 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 -da. <laughs> you know, I'll text it to you. Um, Can't believe I forgot, dude. Do you want to plug anything? Um, yeah, man, I wrote a really cool cookbook that's gotten great reviews and great word of mouth, and people keep hitting me up and showing me recipes that. 
my mom made for me as a kid that that chefs in really cool restaurants all around the world made for me and that's kind of my take on them yeah um you can get it online if you want at back to the kitchen book.com or just go to barnes and noble man they've they've shown me a lot of love and and they dig the book and there's a lot of like, podcast stories in there. i don't want to just write a cookbook no so every recipe kind of has a, a story like the ones i've been telling you I, I think i even tell the story where chuck norris broke my rib in the book what uh, yeah chuck you sparred with him when I was 15, I told you I won a, a bunch of taekwondo yeah. tournaments, and I won a national one and got a really cool trophy that was taller than me. And my godfather goes, oh, he th- his best friend's Chuck Norris. Mm-hmm. They lived four houses away from each other. Donna. They behaved like frat boys for like 20 years and would go to UCLA and like beat up linebackers and like start <laughs> fights. I'm not joking. <laughs> So he goes, oh, you think you're hot shit? Huh? I'm like, yeah, man, I'm fucking killing it. You know, I'm 15, testosterone's flowing. He goes, oh, you want to spar with Chuck? I'm like, and I literally go, yeah, let me show Chuck what I can do. Oh, no. Okay, How old that, was Chuck at the time? Um, probably close to 40. I was 15, so that's... Yeah, probably. Yeah, probably close yeah. to 40. So we, we walked to his house. Um, and my godfather had this great El Camino with like a, like a 408 in it. Like oh, some Jesus. beast. That's not a real engine, but it was huge. Yeah. And he wouldn't even let us go there because he's like, nah, it's too close. We walk down there and we go in his little dojo in the backyard. Um, he doesn't live there anymore. So if you want to see where he used to live, it's on Donna Street. It's a really cool mm-hmm. house. Um, and we go in his little dojo. And like you were saying with that girl, I threw my jab out because my jab's butter, right? And that's what won me that tournament. Yeah. And I throw it out there, pop, 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 pop. And he's kind of just moving and being cool. He does not want to hurt me. He's a nice nice kind yeah. man who loved me and showed me love for you since i was a little real boy. blows at him oh yeah i'm i'm trying you're to going do 100 oh yeah, yeah a hundred like yeah, okay, what's okay. beyond yeah, yeah, that? I'm, yeah. it's chuck norris dude you're gonna do your best yes i get it so i want to look as money as i can look and I, bah, 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 i'm doing like three jabs <laughs> right and he's just like you know being nice yeah. and respectful and then, bah, 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 and then i get cocky and i try to do it again like you can throw three jabs on a guy three times in a row in real life, let alone Chuck fucking Norris. And so I do it again, and he just throws one wheel kick, and he doesn't try to hurt me. He's pulling the kick, and he hits me right in the... But he's a big the, dude. He wasn't that big. Like, I'm taller than he was then now. Like, he was like 5'10". Wow, maybe he's, I just... Remember him opposite Bruce? He wasn't that oh, much bigger yeah. than Bruce. Um, so he throws one wheel kick, and it hits me in what's called the floating rib, and it broke it. Mm. and I hit the ground, and there's a great Richard Pryor joke where he says, you ever have air, just leave your lungs? Like air just says, (laughs) fuck it! (laughs) So I hit the ground, and all I could say was, I can't breathe. (laughs) Like when you lose your breath, which is what my godfather, and he's laughing, but he's like, "Ah!" (laughs) like he thinks it's the funniest thing in the world. (laughs) And I'm down, and Chuck's like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. I'm like, and Chuck, man, my godfather's like, oh, he's fine. Don't fucking worry about it, Chuck. That's a great lesson. I'll see you tonight. Like it's nothing. We're walking home. I'm like doubled over, leaning as hard left as I can because anything upright, it feels like there's a chainsaw cutting oh through my, my body. We go inside. I finally like break down. It's too much pain and I'm kind of crying. And my godmother Lillian comes in. Um, my godfather, 6'1", big tough guy, thin mustache, try to make fun of it. Um, he'll, he'd rock a mullet if he wanted to. <laughs> Nothing anybody could do. My five foot one godmother is Italian and does not fuck around. And literally goes, what, Bob, what did you do to it? What did you do? He goes, I didn't do it. Chuck fucking hurt him. <laughs> and she goes, what's wrong? I go, I think I broke my rib. And he goes, yeah, he probably did. It's the first thing he says. And not to take me to the hospital. <laughs> and my godmother goes, we can't send him home. Like, but Bob, Kathy will, sh- Kathy will shoot you. She will shoot you. And she would have. I told you before. Like, yeah. She didn't fuck around. around. <laughs> I saw her pull a gun in a, in a parking lot when a guy tried to mug her and she pulled her gun out in of New a Mexico? Per- yeah, she pulled her gun out of a purse instead of her wallet. The guy <laughs> went wider <laughs> than your son's legs <laughs> and ran for the hills, bro. <laughs> So uh, I got to stay in California for three extra weeks um, and got to miss the whole first week of school. Because Chuck uh, Norris broke your rib. Yeah, and I didn't tell my mom till I was like 25. And when I finally told her, and it was like, yeah, Lillian freaked out. She said, you would have shot Bob. She's like, I fucking want to shot it. <laughs> I didn't give a crap. Okay, I got one more question now that uh, we brought up Chuck Norris and Bruce Lee. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is all the age-old question. Who wins that fight? Bruce. No doubt. Bruce. Why, just speed? No, man. Bruce was to martial arts what LeBron was to is to basketball. What what Serena Williams was to tennis. He was this hybrid that didn't believe in 
in one style. And he was the one who taught Chuck to sort of accept and embrace that philosophy to the point where Chuck brought the entire Machado family with him to Texas when he was doing Walker, Texas Ranger to embrace jujitsu and use them all as stuntmen to beat up on his show. Like, really? and that was Bruce's philosophy of, of expanding and not, not being a master of, of one being a master of all. Um, and I think in that movie, Chuck did the job to steal a wrestling term, but it was to show that out of respect, this dude's the best. Right. And if Chuck's saying that, but he then, never came out, but that's what I'm saying. Like, right. that's why I think he showed it there and he's passing. Like he didn't have to do that. He didn't have to do that scene. He didn't have to let Bruce snatch a bald spot of hair out of right. his chest hair. Like he didn't have good to one, lose that yeah, fight. Yeah. He could have said, no, thanks. But he did, and he did that because I think he respected what Bruce brought to the table as a martial artist. You, this is a guy, my godfather would be in China with him, and guys would challenge Bruce on the street no. straight up because movie studios said, if you can beat Bruce Lee in a fight, we'll give you a three-picture deal. This was so in he China used to have to 70s. fight on the street? Guys would walk straight up to him. They would, tap their, they would cross their arms and tap their feet three times, and Bruce literally would be in mid-conversation with my godfather and be like, I'll be right back. Whip the shit out of that guy. Come back and go, let's go get some lunch. Stop it. And that's legit, dude. That's, oh, there's other people who hung with Bruce will tell you the same fucking story. That's how hardcore he was. And when he left his deal with China, they were pissed. I don't remember the name of the Wait, film company that he they, was signed So that's with. how they challenged him to a fight. And he would just beat people up on the street and then walk back away. And then bounce and leave. And then eventually he just came to fucking L.A. and was like, fuck all that, man. That's crazy. Everybody wants to fucking kill my ass. That's <laughs> so, yeah. insane. That's why when he passed away, some people like tried to say it was an inside yeah. job and things like that. You know, And then all the conspiracy theories because there was so much of that movie studio's hate of Bruce leaving them because he was their first like uber star you know he became international like Sonny Chiba ain't got shit on Bruce Lee Dude. and I love Sonny Chiba you know what I'm saying but like it's not the same thing that's a fucking great story yeah man so he was the real deal he Look. wasn't just a movie man like he would have beat Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's ass <laughs> Kareem yeah. learned from Bruce Bruce didn't learn from Kareem I also think that when you're seven two you can see kicks and punches coming a little easier. Yeah, but when you're seven two, you know how much time Bruce has to react. That's to what your I mean. Big ass, but like, that's what I mean. Oh, okay, God, you I you're putting it, on Kareem. No, you can yeah. see it coming. Oh yeah, he's like, no, I'm way over here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you're that big arm is reaching back now. Oh yeah. So it's gonna come forward. Soon, My, right? Michael Thompson, who backed Kareem up for the Lakers, uh, he's Clay yeah. Thompson's uh, yeah, yeah. daddy. I've done his radio show a couple times. He, always, he was best friends with Kareem. He always gets mad at me when I say, he's like, Kareem! Because you can't say nothing against Kareem, right? Kareem's the best at it. He's like, Kareem would have killed no. Bruce Lee. I'm like, Michael. He's like, I could beat Bruce Lee. I'm like, Michael, you could. Bruce Lee's dead. He'd beat you up if you went to his grave. <laughs> Can I tell you something? I, what I want to do, and when I know people like, so he loves Kareem. Yeah. My whole goal when I go on oh, these shows you like Bill that. Oh, Russell him? Uh, no, I would Kevin McHale him. Oh, <laughs> okay. I'd Michael, once, I'd, Michael had to guard Kevin yes, McHale. Yes. Kevin McHale and Michael Thompson played basketball on the same team in Minnesota yes, together. Yes. And then had to play again. And Michael always like, oh, I hated that guy but more than any. So they when, love each other. But when they I hated, know yeah. stuff like that. Oh, that would I have three crazy. older brothers. So my what's more fun for me is just to argue the opposite. Yeah. It's more fun to go but on But you show. get him with a Mikhail. Oh, oh I'd hit him with a Mikhail or even a Robert Parrish. Uh, uh, well, no, that one won't get him as hot because he, he has the res <laughs> more respect for it. I uh, hit him with a Mikhail and be like, you know what? You know who's better than Kareem is Mikhail. <laughs> Oh, he, would, he might hit you. He might hit. I'm filling in for him tomorrow on, on ESPN. And if they like me and if I do a good job and I, I get a regular gig there, I got to bring you in when Michael's there just Please, so we dude. can have a Kevin McHale debate. And let me tell you something else. <laughs> Please come back and do this. Yeah, because, anytime. Dude, uh, like I said, I knew from the text that I would like you, but you, I, I'm, I'm all about positive energy, dude. And you I can tell, man, just from your wall of photos, I know what you're all about. And I know that you're about making people's lives better regardless of, of, of the level of better. Um, and that's, that's super cool. Yeah. Like I follow you, dude. I see how you deal with people. I see how you deal with humans, whether they're, they're good or bad or just trying to survive. And, and I like that vibe. So that's why, that's why I'm here, man. It's easy. I appreciate it, man. And, and guys, I'm going to be, I don't know what the date is. <laughs> it's your high walk. I know it's Monday, August 15th. I'm going to be in St. Louis this weekend. And it's going to be 127 degrees. So get to the club because there's air conditioning. Yeah, get inside. It's sticky sack season, everybody. Ooh. All right. Oh, I took a pro wrestling move in St. Louis. I took a backbreaker in St. Louis from Randy Orton. How'd that go? Not good. That's a big dude. And by the way, like he protected me and took care of me. And the next day, 
I wouldn't have been wrestling. No. <laughs> I was like, dude, you do this 340 <laughs> days a year? Dude, that's why they I deserve all the respect. Like a work. bowl of Wheaties and two weeks of sleep. <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> I literally was like, my fucking neck. Yeah, I would have a, de- I would have a different bowl of Wheaties. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. Love you. We'll talk soon later. Peace. Buddies. 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 Buddies.